this portfolio committee meeting of agriculture, land reform and rural development. Allow me to welcome the minister, Mwamutogo Tideza, as well as the deputy ministers, uh, the honorable Mwamukapa and the honorable uh, deputy minister Squatcha, the officials of the department as led by the DG Ndate Ramasodi and all the honorable members on this uh, portfolio Recording in progress. that uh, we uh, have on today. We have uh, our agenda honorable members, which is uh, uh, on two items where we'll be receiving a briefing by the Department of Agriculture and Reform and Rural Development, together with the Special Master of Labor Tenants and the Land uh, Claims Court about the settlement of the labor tenants applications and the complementary support services after allocation of land. As you would recall, honorable members on our oversight, we came across many uh, labor uh, tenant claims that uh, uh, were unresolved. And we would like to therefore gain an understanding from the department as to how far we've progressed in dealing and uh, settling those uh, labor uh, tenant claims. We will have also further input by the Department of uh, Land Reform and Rural Development uh, on uh, Animal Protection Amendment Bill. Allow me, therefore, honorable members, to welcome you all and say good morning. Huyamore, Sanibonani, Dumelang, uh, and uh, ensure then that uh, we hand over to the Honorable Minister Mamutogo Tideza for her opening remarks before we head into the presentation. Mamutogo Tideza, you can go ahead and participate. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson and uh, our Honorable Members, as well as senior officials and the Special Master on the platform. As you indicated, Chairperson, this meeting is more about the progress report on the matters that you have highlighted. We have prepared a presentation that would illustrate uh, how far we have gone in the settlement of the labor tenants' claims as directed both by the Constitution, our legislation on labor tenants, as well as what uh, the court um, judgment uh, said. In this presentation, we will also receive the report of the special master who would highlight the work that he has done after assuming office on how he has viewed the way in which such um, claims ought to be resolved. He will also highlight what in his views may have been gaps, particularly on research that in his view might have uh, disadvantaged the beneficiaries of such um, claims. At the same time, we'll also indicate what systems he has put in place in order to make sure that we resolve these claims as per what the court instructed us to do. I do also hope that in the presentation, the Portfolio committee members will get a sense of where we are. It might not be as fast as we had all uh, hoped to, but I think the direction is clear on the process uh, going forward. On the issues relating to the Animal Protections Amendment Bill, we have reflected on this matter, took into consideration the discussion in the last portfolio committee. We also endeavored to have an engagement with the Honorable Swart, and unfortunately that never took place. But from where we see it, Honorable Chepe said, we do think that there is more to reflect on this bill given what it purports to achieve. In respect of animal uh, protection legislation, we are confident as a country and as government that what we have is adequate. We also feel that the amendment is proposed looks narrowly 
at the issue of um, testing of uh, cosmetics. And you will appreciate, Chairperson, that the cosmetic and uh, foodstuff legislation lies with the Department of Health. And also, some of the measures that are being proposed in the current bill relates to the sale, manufacturing, and trade, which veers on the sphere of the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition. Our view is that we cannot use a legislation or an amendment in one section which has an impact directly on the others. But also, one of the concerns that we have is that the bill, as indicated, looks only at cosmetics, doesn't deal with broader research that is done on animals, nor even on vaccine development where certain uh, efficacies are tested on animals. And from where we sit, we also do not believe the way currently even the testing that is done is actually harmful to, or rather pose cruelty on animals. So our view is that we don't think the bill is desirable. However, if the committee feels otherwise, we are making some recommendations which the team will talk to towards the end. But I just thought it's important to put it up front, our views having gone through and through, uh, through the bill and also some public uh, presentations that had been made in this regard. Chairperson, I will take it back to you in terms of the agenda as you will uh, go through uh, the presentations that will be done on the labor tenants and later on the animal protection amendment bill. I can see already the special master there and his team are anxious to brief and looking forward to brief this committee. Thank you and over to you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable uh, Minister for the opening remarks. Honorable members will uh, now welcome the presentation by the department. DG and officials of the department, you may proceed. A special master, good morning. Your microphone is muted, we can't hear you. Good morning, Chairperson. Good morning, Minister. Good morning, um, Honourable Members. Thank you. Thank you. Please proceed. Okay, I think just ask for a minute or so. Uh, <laughs> I think the special master is asking for some minutes. I don't know. Uh, uh, Bonkosi from the department is ready on his side. I, I think Bonkosi I, is there with his presentation from the department. So mm. is the special master going first or Bonkosi from the department are you going first? Who's taking the lead? In terms of the agenda, it's supposed to be Bonkosi, the department, and then followed by the special master. Thank you, uh, Honorable Minister. Let us, uh, Honorable Members, uh, allow the department to proceed with the presentation. Babon Kosi, please enlarge the presentation for us to see, and you may proceed. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson, um, and Honorable Members, the Minister, Deputy Ministers, the DG and the colleagues, at the special master. Uh, I'm going to take you through the presentation on the labor tenants, the performance, and then- Yeah, before you take us through, please enlarge the presentation. From my side, it's a full screen chairperson. I don't know, maybe the technology is, 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 is a- Ralph, please assist. Uh, we can uh, see all the slides on the side, uh, and this is why it's appearing small. Uh, 
but if you can just put it on slide mode so we can see it more uh, enlarged and closer. It is showing your entire computer. Um, Manyam Zamam Kakaza, can we get uh, IT to assist? Monkosi, are you still there? Yes, Honorable Bishopson, I'm, 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 I've, I've unshared mine so that maybe Ralph can help me with the with the sharing of the presentation because I I don't know what's happening to me. It's a full screen, uh, but from that side, it looks like it's uh, it's not it's, it's not well, it's not the um, it's not reflecting properly. Okay. Let us uh, proceed while the IT tries to uh, figure out how to enlarge this. Go ahead, Bobonkos. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Yeah, the, it is enlarged, I, I so hope we may proceed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I am going to, my, my presentation will just focus on the issues that are here. Uh, uh, minister have touched on the legislative um, uh, mandate and the provisions that we focusing on in terms of the implementation of the labor tenants, the implementation plan and the progress, the capacity issues in terms of HR, human resources, the performance on the program, the, the budget as requested uh, by the committee, the allocation, the expenditure to date, and then finally, the budget allocation for 2023-24, which is this financial year. The next slide. Then the, the, these are just the acronyms. I will move to the next slide. The in terms of the briefing from the from the committee, it's secretariat, we are requested to provide for the a, a presentation on the annual and operational performance targets uh, as uh, uh, which we are going to break it down the province the performance on 2022-23 the budget allocation and the mtsf estimates the budget allocated to the special master for 2023-24 and the budget allocation the, the expenditure with that regard and also the budget allocation for 2023-24 and as well as the expenditure that we have incurred in 2022-23. And then finally, the budget that is allocated to the special master for 2023, which is the operational budget 24. Next slide. Uh, the minister have alluded to this, uh, that the program, especially the settlement of uh, labor tenants, is in is emanates from the Labor Tenants Act, um, which obviously talks to the provision of security of tenure to labor tenants or persons who have occupied or using land as a result of their association with the labor tenancy. And, and it also provides for the state or the department to acquire land uh, to confirm those rights of labor tenants on that particular in on that particular piece of land. And again. It is important to note that the this act is very, very um, religious and also is very procedural in terms of what needs to be done. And on the right hand side, it's just an indication of the key sections that we are focusing on in terms of the settlement of these labor tenants, which the section 16 notices, which was the applications by 31st, which was extended to 31st March 2001 and also then the section 17, the notices, as well as the section 18, which relates to the settlement of this labor tenant claims, the process, the procedure that we followed in terms of settlement of this labor tenant claims. So in, in essence, the focus on the ones we have received 
is mainly on those three pieces or those sections, uh, section 16, 17, and 18, that talks to the, the final resolution of these particular claims. Next slide. This slide just provides for what, what is contained, what was contained in summary in a high level in the implementation plan that uh, the, or, the court ordered the, the department together with the appointed special master to on labor tenants to, to develop and get the, the court to approve, which was approved by the court. And, and then it contained the, these particular six areas, which are very important. One of them, which I can mention, um, is the statistics around what, how many claims that were lodged, and and also how many claims that were to be still to be finalized, and secondly, the issue that related to the assessment of the skills uh, within the department and in infrastructure that is, that is necessary for the implementation of this, the targets on year on year on year basis on a year two year basis for the resolution of the outstanding um, claims um, or still to be finalized uh, that were lodged and also the budget allocation um, uh, to be covered in the implementation plan and the plan to coordinate the settlement of those uh, claims and, and referrals to court um, in terms of the, the plan, how that was going to be done and any other matters that the special master uh, had to consider relevant uh, for inclusion in the in the in the in the implement in the settlement of the outstanding labor tenant claims. That is in a high level the implementation the the contents of the implementation plan. Next slide. This is what the strategy was uh, implemented and adopted, which are ten stages, which we are currently implementing together with the special master, as a department together with the provinces. Uh, you will note from the presentation by the special master, and he will touch on some of the key issues, uh, systems and uh, um, procedures that he has uh, introduced to assist us in the implementation of this particular strategy around the implementation of the, of the implementation plan. I'm not going to go through each one of them. However, we are guided by this particular 10 stages and this strategy to implement the 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 the, the labor tenant and the outstanding labor tenant claims and the court order. Next slide. Uh, this is the summary highlights of what was contained in terms of numbers and statistics in the implementation plan. As when we submitted the implementation plan, the 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 stats submitted were um, in terms of the lodgement, it was over twenty thousand. And what was outstanding was around 9,333 um, in terms of the statistics at the time. And, and obviously on the issue of the, on the right-hand side, uh, you see the MTF uh, targets that we, we have put forward in the implementation plan to court um, over the five year, over the, the period uh, of the special master, um, you will see the, the up to now in terms of the 2023-24, the our target uh, uh, for the settlement of the outstanding labor tenant claims was supposed to be 2,500. But I will I will talk to that when I get to the actual targets that we receive from each one of the provinces and the the reasons why the there is a discrepancy between the what is in the in the implementation plan and what is in the actual annual operational plan of the department in terms of settlement. In terms of the budget, the MTSF budget um, focus that we put forward in the implementation plan, those are the figures uh, that you have, which were mainly a consolidation uh, of the budget that is allocated to the tenure reform program across the programs. Uh, that is not necessarily um, when it was presented, was not necessarily uh, divided or split into the, into the different programs within tenure. That was the actual allocation. That is currently what the the budget structure is in the department. Um, uh, they allocate the budget is not separated in terms of the um, of of each one of the programs within the tenure. 
we including inclusive including the labor tenants program uh, you will call uh, honorable chair and the honorable members there was a request which we are working on to say let's separate the budget so that the specific budget for allocated for labor tenants there is a process that um, the, the the branch um, is working on together with the cfo uh, to look into that uh, obviously there are processes that will need to be followed to get that separate that separate budget specific to a particular program the coordination obviously quarterly we present we go back to court to report on with the special master to report on the on the progress that we have made and any other systems that we have introduced in terms of the implementation of this uh, we 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 project, produce um, uh, reports on a quarterly basis to the land claims court and present we currently busy with another one for this particular reporting period uh, the skills and infrastructure that was done and assessed uh, uh, that process was completed uh, by the special master next slide the next slide, uh, you will see the different. The, 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 there is a difference between the what I presented around the numbers. Uh, we, after we have done the verification, having submitted the report to the land claims court, we discovered that in particular the province of Limpopo, which uh, has, has increased uh, the the numbers when we did the verification, specifically because the there was the change of boundaries, especially in the Sikukune district. And there were labor tenants that, that were supposed to have fallen under the Pumalanga province. And after the, the new demarcations, those farms then had to fall under the Limpopo province. And then the numbers then increased from Limpopo in terms of the final verification that the figures that we have currently from 194 to 347. That is why you can see the difference between what I have presented before in the previous slide on what was presented to court and what we actually have now, uh, which is now the outstanding sits at 9,468 9, instead of 9,383. That is just that um, a difference. And obviously, the, you will note that in terms of the performance in the next slides, in the, in the program, in the settlement or finalization of the labor tenant claims that are outstanding, the pace, the, the current challenge is that the, the, the process is very slow uh, for a number of reasons. However, the, together with the special master, there is a, a system that has been developed to try and, 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 and resolve these particular libertarian claims in a, a very uh, programmatic uh, way, uh, where we cluster the, 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 the farms together in what we call the multi-accelerated claims resolution initiative, uh, the MACRI, and which has already this financially identified about a total of 28 farms that will, that will be uh, pipeline projects that we are embarking on, especially affecting the two provinces, which is Kaiseten and Pumalanga, which seems to be having the majority of outstanding labor tenant claims still to be finalized. We are also <clears throat> mindful of the fact that there, there are other claims that when we are busy in the processing of labor tenant claims, we find that there are some other uh, claims that we discover as we, we, we process the, the labor tenant claims. Of, although the numbers, they are not very, um, we, we not, don't have the specific number in terms of what we can call untraceable or lost. But however, together with the special master, we have since developed a lost claim strategy in terms of dealing with those claims that we come across uh, where there is information is not um, available in our, in our system. The next slide. This is just the indication of the capacity that is available um, within the tenure program at, at large. It's not necessarily the capacity that is available for only for the settlement of labor tenants. Uh, this capacity that is available, which is 
one of the key challenges that we're having. Um, uh, it serves all the programs under the land, 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 land tenure program, which across all the programs, your CPAs, ESTA, your other programs, the tax adjustment, the labor tenants, which is, which is one of the challenges. Currently, what the department has done, um, the, we have finalized for tenure, uh, a fit for purpose uh, structure that is in progress, that is in process, uh, which will be processed through the departmental processes, which also covers, uh, provides for the capacity that is required on a permanent basis to deal with the issues of uh, the settlement of labor tenants. However, as an interim measure, the department has, has um, concluded contracts or renewed contracts in the, especially in the province of Mpumalanga, KZN, the contracts that were available for labor tenants, they've been converted into permanent. Uh, in Bumalanga, 18 of those, of those uh, 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 positions, they are still on contract. However, the biggest problem is that when you appoint persons on a contract basis, uh, it can only be, we can only be allowed to appoint them on a 12 month basis in terms of DPSA uh, um, uh, policy. And, and we are in the process of re-advertising those particular positions so that we, we will always have capacity to implement the labor tenants. However, in some of them, you find that the, the labor tenants, the, the, these officials will get permanent positions like you can see in the slide on the right-hand side that we're only left with 18 now in Bumalanga from the 18 because the 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 other the other officials have now received uh, applied for permanent positions in other provinces and and and, and across government next slide this is the the the, the performance uh, since 2020 21 um, after the court order however you can see uh, honorable uh, chairperson and honorable members that the performance has not been very good. Is uh, in fact, it's, it's not it's not uh, it's dismal performance for a number of reasons, which we have identified, and we intend to work together with the special master to improve on this performance. If you look at 2022, the last financial year 23, uh, in terms of the implementation plan, the target was supposed to be 2,000. However, the target that we consolidated from provinces in terms of what needs to be settled was 966. However, and the performance was only 51 labor tenant claims settled, which is something that is not um, we 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 we're working on. We have to improve uh, with the, the challenges that we have across the board. Next slide. This slide just indicates the, the land that we've acquired through this program. However, these uh, figures, they include not only the labor tenants, the land that's required for labor tenants, is the land that's also been acquired and disposed to farm dwellers, uh, your ESTA occupiers together with the, the labor tenants. There are provinces that have done very well, like KZN and Bumalanga in terms of achieving, over achieving their targets, but there are provinces that have not done very well. We, we have also the, the final verification uh, of this target as indicated that the, the national target, we have, over, we have achieved it, uh, the 5,000 hectares um, uh, with the recent verification, which is m &E is working on. When we provide the final um, uh, report um, in terms of the performance of the department as a whole, in terms of our APP and AOP targets, that will be reflected. For now, the, what has been verified uh, indicates a variance of only 178 hectares in terms of the national target. However, at a provincial level, there is a lot that still needs to be done in terms of acquisition of land. And I think the chairperson have alluded to this fact to say that uh, during the oversight, there were cut a number of issues uh, which relates to security of tenure for farm dwellers including labor tenants. Next slide. This is the budget uh, allocation, um, uh, especially to the Office of the Special Master for Operational Budget. 
uh, these are the figures and 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 this is the amount uh, in 2022 you look at the, the the figures it was 18 million that was provided that was set aside allocated to the special master 7.7 .7 million was was um, was 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 spent in the in the particular period next slide for 2023-24, which is this current financial year, 16.2 million rand has been allocated through the budget of the department uh, to the special master for operational, um, uh, for the operation day-to-day -day running of the office of the special master. Next slide. In terms of the, <laughs> you will see honorable chair and honorable members, that in terms of the current financial year, if you look at the consolidated uh, targets in the AOP of the, 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 the broken down the province, it's not near anywhere to the what we have presented in the implementation plan to court, which is supposed to be around the figure of 2,500 to be settled in this 2023-24 financial year. Which, 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 which we have noticed the the misalignment between the targets, uh, as approved in the labor tenants implementation plan, and the AOP uh, consolidated from each one of the of the provinces that have got labor tenants, which we are intending to address. Our view and the advice that we've got uh, from our legal services was to say we need to because of the challenges that we're having in the final resolution of. The outstanding labor tenant claims. We need to appraise the, the land claims court around the, the this matter on the targets versus what is in the implementation plan, so that there they can be some sort of an alignment. Um, one of the bigger issues, as I've alluded to, is the we have got a lot of um, labor tenant claims uh, from the outstanding claims. Which are sitting, um, which are, needs to be referred to court via the office of the state attorney. I've alluded to that in the previous um, uh, uh, in the previous slides. Obviously, there is an issue of capacity in the across the board in the offices of the state attorney, and also which we are working on. And the special master, I think, he will also talk to the interventions around the quality of submissions. Uh, to the state attorney and the process, the revised process uh, to get these court uh, referrals to court, these, these cases to be referred to court. Because uh, they, if I can make an example of Pumalanga, they've got over 400 uh, cases that are needed to be referred to court, which obviously as a result of the denials uh, uh, by landowners denying the status of labor tenants. And case that and they also have over 70 uh, cases that uh, are referred to this office of the state attorney and for referral to court those are the numbers that we have and it, however the process is too slow and some of these cases have been there with the office of the state, state attorney for over a year or two years now uh, which we are trying to clean up uh, working together with the special master the last uh, the next slide this is the targets for in terms of land acquisition for this financial year. Uh, the, the, the target has increased uh, by 685 from 5,000 in terms of acquisition of land which, uh, for, for farm dwellers, which, is, which include labor tenants. The, the problem with the, when we acquire the land, uh, the problem to separate land acquisition or land or hectares for labor tenants from those of estate occupiers is a bit difficult, mainly because in each farm you find that um, when you circle a labor tenant, it's not the only household on the farm. There are also estate occupiers who does not also have, who suffer the same um, um, uh, atrocities like the labor tenants. The only difference that the other households or other families or two or three of the families have lodged the labor tenant uh, uh, claims in terms of section 16 of the labor tenants act however they are also as the occupiers when we circle and acquire a property we provide long-term security of tenure to all the households or families 
residing on that particular farm. Hence, it will be very difficult to separate the hectares acquired only for labor tenants, for the settlement of labor tenants, and from that of the ester occupiers found in a particular piece of land. Next slide. Finally, this is the 2023-24 the, the budget allocation, which is uh, in total is 218 uh, million. And the, the planning, which include other programs uh, within tenure, uh, the 218 is for acquisition of land for ester occupiers together with labor tenants. And then on the planning, uh, this, the, 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 the budget allocation for planning, it, it also include other programs like your title adjustment, CPAs, uh, Tranca, and all of those other programs that we implement as the uh, under the program land tenure. However, you will see that uh, in Limpombo, you will see a zero. We have already we have also corrected that. The they are the the we have corrected that uh, through engagements with the province because they do have uh, uh, labor tenant claims that they need to settle. They, they've got a budget allocation, which, which finance is working on. And they currently, they are looking at about 8.7 million. We will amend this once the uh, proper approvals and the shifting of budget has been finalized. Uh, Honorable Chair and the members, that is the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, let us, honorable members, also take uh, the presentation from the pre special master so we can uh, have uh, questions and clarity uh, afterwards on both presentations. I now invite the special master. Thank you, Sharp Sharp. You may proceed. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honourable Members. Um, thanks to the Department for that uh, presentation. Um, okay, ours is a is a short presentation. We're going to begin with an. Uh, we, we're going to begin with a short introduction and background. Uh, I think uh, Wong Inkosi has really um, <clears throat> outlined a lot of issues which I don't really want to repeat in this presentation that we're going to make. <clears throat> we're going to talk about the claims resolution methodology, which uh, Wong Inkosi referred to. We're going to look at some successes, challenges, and, and talk about the way forward. So um, I think he, uh, we have already heard uh, correctly so of the establishment of the Office of the uh, Special Master. Um, we are a very small component uh, of, of, of people. Um, and the reasons why we had this intervention was that the, the court decided that <clears throat> because the department was unable to resolve the claims expeditiously, expeditiously, they would want to play a supervisory monitoring and oversight role. So the special master is the agent through which institutional court um, took. Um, so basically, w the key challenges I think that we've been trying to address is, is firstly to ensure that we have a database in place, because we even saw from the presentation by the department that the actual numbers, there is still uncertainty around them. And as was explained, there are also a lot of untraceable claims or claimants and uh, claims that have been lost. So um, as was pointed out, we have developed a lost claim strategy. 
And we have already tested that in the field on those 28 farms that the department uh, referred to. And I think that will uh, go some way in, in terms of dealing with the very vexed question of lost claims. Um, so, I think the, the, the critical thing is, is to say is that, as I've, I've indicated, it's not really the special master, it's the land claims court which is exercising this role and the agency through which this is exercised is the special master. Um, but I think the intention is clear and I, I, I do think we spend too much time with the department arguing over the precise powers and functions of the special master. Um, those are there in the court and the special master is, is the agent and that does require the special master to exercise a quality assurance role. And the only way that can be done is by engaging with the actual uh, resolution that are proposed, whether through acquisition of land straight without a court process or through the papers that are, pre are prepared for court. So I think, um, for example, in the case of Mpumalanga, uh, we were asked by the state attorney um, to attend a meeting. And in that meeting, uh, the state attorney raised serious problems around the quality of the bundle uh, in the court referral. So we have established clarity on exactly what needs to go into that bundle, how uh, the different uh, documents, including the section 16, section 17, deeds, uh, title deeds, et cetera, together with an overview summary report uh, from the DG, who is the agent through which matters are referred to court. So I think that's very important. And currently we are in Mpumalanga and we have uh, the officials from Pumalanga and Gauteng in a training program, which I think will considerably speed up and expedite what happens from, from here onwards. Uh, so let's say that in order to get uh, quality into that court referral bundle, we need to um, use different methods. Uh, these bring together what we may call three voices. The first is the archival documents, which is the applications, the notices, and the title deeds. The second is the voice of labor tenants themselves. And this is through the narration and recording of their life histories. Now, we don't intend to set up a, a process whereby for each and every claimant, we're gonna have a, a book. We are basically trying to get the key aspects of the history of the labor tenant in terms of the definition of labor tenants in the act over three generations. And we're gonna back that up through the voice of the land itself within the archives of the department in the National Geospatial Institute in Robo Cape Town, we have archival records of aerial photo photographs going back to the 1920s. And those are significant in terms of establishing um, the veracity of a claimant uh, because we are able through the location of huts which are clearly visible, plowing land which is clearly visible uh, to establish the presence. Just talking about land and stuff now. I'm just waiting for them to get back to the animal stuff. Honourable Minister. Please Sorry. mute the microphone. Can we not disturb the special master's presentation. Please make sure you mute your microphone. Okay, Wait so I think... Oh, the special master, you may proceed. Oh, thank you very much, uh, honorable chair. So I think these, um, what we're able to identify on the, on the maps historically over the generations up until the present are key landmarks, which, uh, indicate uh, evidence of labor tenants, their parents and grandparents presence on particular pieces of land. And I think this is basically with the life histories, we are able to establish a much stronger picture of the veracity of claims and claimants individually. So if we look at um, this slide, 
which I think is a good overview summary of um, what we are trying to uh, explain here is that uh, first we have the documentation, the critical documentation, the, the section 16 application, the section 17 notice, and then we, we begin to implement the uh, methodology. So we conduct the life history research, we conduct the geospatial investigation, we produce a life history research report, we prepare the claim dossier together with a geospatial investigation report, which shows the history of the land, the changes in land use, the changes in land cover, uh, and so on. And then um, it can go in different directions, partic uh, depending particularly on the stance of the landowner. If the landowner has some indication of settlement, we can apply uh, mediation. Um, if there is absolutely no willing willingness on the side of the land uh, owner to acknowledge uh, the presence of labor tenants, then we would uh, refer the matter to court. The court itself will have options then. It can allow for litigation or it can refer the matter for arbitration. So, um, there is a panel of, of arbitrators, which is currently in the process of being established, and that also will considerably speed up the claims. Uh, I think it's it's quite important to say at this point that, you know, um, since I've come, there's been a change in the legal support or legal representation of labor tenants. And uh, I was I was sort of in moved in when decisions had already been taken. Um, and I'm not sure we have discussed it uh, to some extent with the department, but I'm really concerned um, with the legal representation matter. Currently, uh, Legal Aid South Africa is responsible for providing um, legal representation to labor tenants, but essentially Legal Aid was not established to do this kind of work. And they are trying to put capacity in place. And I think we have a challenge around um, the quality of what is being put in place. Um, a lot of the, the lawyers that we've, we've come across are new to um, resolving matters of this nature, to dealing with land matters. And I think the, the, the consequence is that we aren't going to get the quality of legal support for labor tenants that is really desired. And we are certainly not going to get the quality required for impact litigation. We do need to establish precedents, precedents which relate, for example, even to lost claims, precedents which uh, relate to the whole question of just and equitable compensation in, in, in different formats. Obviously, that is guided by the Constitution and the provisions in Section 25, but I think we do need to really try and get the precedents in place because we have a great concern about um, the exercise of market value as the sole determinant and the kinds of prices which are being paid and the manner in which they differ from the recommendations that come from the chief um, a, 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 the office of the evaluator general. And I think that's really uh, a key problem that we are trying to grapple with now. And as we'll point out in our conclusion, it's why we have managed to attract uh, some seed money to really try and get some precedence in place um, from um, the impact uh, investment uh, sector and the, <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. So the next slide here, we are, we, we, we name the farms that we've been, been working on. And uh, these are the 28 that were referred to by the department. Now, I think there's a number of issues that come out of this work that we've been doing. Um, and these include the fact that when we began, we thought there were uh, in the region of 450 claims, and now there are over 600 claims that we are dealing with. And this is because we have been testing an instrument to determine uh, whether or not claims have been lost. So on particular farms, 
um, one has found we started looking at 64 claimants um, in the case of Leofontaine and Mpumalanga, and we ended up looking in the region of 100 claimants. So I think um, <clears throat> that's one of the, the, the issues that has emerged out of this. Um, we've also seen uh, some fraudulent tra transactions, which you report to the department. They had been uh, also brought to the attention of other authorities, including the Triple BE Commission, that confirmed a case of fronting and mis misrepresentation on one of the transactions. And the amount involved in this transaction is about 115 million rand, um, where grants for labor tenants and farm workers were utilized. Um, but the, the, the shareholder scheme, as it was referred to, was completely non-compliant. Uh, and there was a lot of unhappiness on the side of the trusts that had been sent, set up for the beneficiaries. Uh, I think more important now, though, <clears throat> we have set up a, a claims resolution system uh, from scratch, which will institutionalize digitization, which will bring greater certainty to the actual numbers, um, which we will be reporting on to court and uh, which the department and ourselves can also report to, to parliament on. Um, <clears throat> We also trying to strengthen project management. Obviously, there's a question that has been raised around um, skills. We have been uh, using uh, learning and engagement platforms, and we now have started uh, uh, capacity development workshops, uh, which we, as I've indicated, we are doing here in Pumalanga with this, all the staff from Mpumalanga and Gauteng working on labor tenant claims. And this is going to be important. I think it has been noted by the department that there's nothing at the moment which is, or there's no one who is a dedicated uh, staff member working exclusively on labor tenant claims. Um, obviously through this training program and what follows, which essentially is going to focus very much um, on the claims in the Macri from Mpumalanga and Guazulu Natal. But in the case of Mpumalanga, we will follow up with a meeting in Nelspreit with the chief director and the director tenure, where we are going to plot out the uh, finalization of the Mpumalanga claims in, in the Macri. And what I've noted is that they exceed the existing targets when they are broken down by province in the department. But we'll engage with the department around that and through the war room, which uh, was indicated in the department's presentation, we will track those quite rigorously to ensure that we get results that matters are referred to court, um, that those uh, involving acquisition of land um, are, are concluded and uh, land, land is bought and transferred to labor tenant beneficiaries. Um, so I think in terms of the challenges, uh, perhaps what the department did not mention was uh, the delays caused by, by COVID. Uh, when we were beginning, that, that certainly was a, a big challenge. Um, I think the department has, has struggled to adhere to the directors of the court since we in instituted the courtly court directives and a lot of time has been lost, uh, which we have quantified in a compliance register. Um, I think also th there are delays now around the new methodology. Essentially, that flow chart that I depicted uh, have been written up as a um, st standard operating procedure, uh, which we're hoping that the department will adopt. Now, I think it's important to say that we didn't completely recreate the wheel. We began with the standard operating procedures that existed, and we added in the steps of the oral life history, as well as the geomatic investigation. And we obviously tightened up on other areas, but essentially we have been waiting a year for the approval of the standard operating procedures. And here in Mpumalanga and uh, what we've seen from the intention of Gauteng, they really want to move. 
uh, but KZN is is still saying they're waiting for the for the national office to approve the standard operating procedures. So I think that for me is the absolute priority now is to get approval on those so that we can if there's certainty and we can move forward uh, decisively in order to um, <clears throat> you know speed up the process considerably. Uh, the issue of staffing, uh, the department has spoken frankly about that. Um, they have given us an undertaking that at no stage uh, will there be no staffing place. So there was, uh, during the previous year, a period of um, six months and all the uncertainties around it, it really becomes many more months because people know that their contract's coming to an end and then they wait for finalization. Once they've been interviewed, some fall aside, some come back new ones come in. So I think the contract situation obviously needs to be resolved as soon as possible. Now, in terms of public service regulations, it's, it, it should only take a maximum of 12 months to create a permanent post. So ideally, the process would have begun before so that we aren't moving into another phase of renewal of contracts, but we are going to appoint permanent staff. But it looks like there'll have to be another phase of contract appointments, which are certainly not ideal in terms of motivating the officials' concern and the uncertainty in, in, in which they face as contract staff. Um, obviously, the, the issue of lost claims is a vexed one, but we do uh, have agreement now uh, between all the parties in the, the, the court process, and we will definitely move forward uh, dealing with that particular, particular matter. Um, from our side, we, we view the, the department as our major partner, and we intend continuing to strengthen the relationship. Uh, I hope we're not going to be in a situation where we only talk the same hymn book when we are engaging in parliament, but we, we sing from the same hymn book when we, when we work together at all levels, um, in the provinces, with the, um, national leadership of the the program and that we really get down and focus on the real focus and that is labor tenants this this whole issue is not about um, the department the special master the court those are decisions that have been taken i think certainly me personally as an agent of the court we we have long agreed with the dg that that is how we need to work. There's no issue at that level, but it needs to percolate down throughout the system so that we can really just focus on labor tenants because uh, the real issue, I haven't really spoken about what we find in the field. Most of the time I've spent on those 28 farms. I've seen a broad cross section of, of, of claimants. I've seen labor tenants who have lost hope completely. Uh, the first matter we brought to, to court, the applicant passed away before we could even get him into the court. So I think that is a big challenge is that many of the labor tenants are getting old now. And, um, you know, what we really need to do is to ensure that the constitutional promise in terms of Section 25 of, 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 of Chapter 2 of the Constitution, as well as the Labor Tenant Act is brought to life and we find a real resolution of the claim. So this will in, we will need to have impact litigation. Hence, I've indicated we have managed to um, get some funding in and um, that is being used for, for matters which are in the court now. Um, the standard operating procedures, the approval of that really needs to, to come about without any further delay. Um, and obviously to um, embrace the supervisory monitoring and oversight responsibilities. Those are the responsibilities of the court. I'm the agent and we shouldn't be bickering around whether or not I should quality assure documents going to court because this has been identified from the level of the state attorney as, 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 as a priority. So we shouldn't really, we should drop our egos, we should work professionally and we should really, really work to accelerate um, the process of resolving the claims. Uh, thank you very much on that note, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members. Uh, I conclude my presentation. Thank you.
Thank you, honorable members. That's the presentation uh, from uh, the Department of Agriculture and Reform and Rural Development, as well as a presentation from the Special Master on uh, labor tenants uh, claims. We'll now open the session for questions of clarity or comments. Honorable Kape. Thank you, Chairperson. It's very dark on my side here. I have tried to open all the curtains and windows. Chair, let me welcome today's presentation and acknowledge this committee's willingness to pay oversight on matters that are close to the hearts of many, especially the vulnerable in this country. The chair, the presentation by the department glaringly on the targets for implementation on their APP as well as operational plans. It indicates a downward spiral, despite that downward, there's no achievements. Both the department and the special master has had targets. But when you look at the annual performance, even for 22, 2023, only 5% of the targets were achieved on that slide. Now, Chair, I just want to find out what are the pace of settlement of labor tenants that is not in increasing despite monitoring by the land claims court through the special master? What plans do they have despite whatever they put here before us? I mean, we can discuss efficiency processes, methodology if necessary, but the bottom line is that less labor tenants claims are being settled. There's no information provided, even about the quality of settlements and how it improves the lives of our labor tenants or even their descendants. And the special master has just indicated issues, challenges in terms of quality. The report chair does not say how many people benefited. They are putting together farm dwellers and labor tenants. We have no qualms, I have no qualms with Esther, but this put a blur on the targeted people or the target which are labor tenants. And I want to hear also from the, the, the special master whilst I'm at it, or how does this kind of reporting affect what he's overseeing? That Bonjingo is saying is very difficult to determine the hectares because there will be two households here and whatever. Why don't you say to us two households benefited out of that so that we know the number if we are winning this fight of settling the labor tenants. Now, the report does not say what are the beneficiaries doing on the land, for an example. What is lost, Chair, for me on this presentation is the transformational agenda of the legislation, especially in, in relation to support the beneficiaries that were targeted. Now, the Act Chair provides that minister shall from all monies appropriated by parliament grant advance, advances and subsidies for acquisition of land rights in land by labor tenants and development of land occupied or occupied by, to be occupied by labor tenants. Hence I'm saying the report is silent on what is happening for those that are even clapped together with your uh, Esther people, your farm dwellers. Chair, I think uh, we also saw this, the slide here, Limpopo, zero, and we are told 
despite the slow pace or what non existence of performance called Impopo is zero, and we are told about eight comma something million that will be put there. Treasury is still busy with it. It's not here in black and white, it's zero. We don't know even if it's going to happen. Hore, what is the special master, what will he say about Limpopo in this regard? Because what is very key, Chen, as when I was looking at the, um, I will interact with both at the same time in other instances. The farms that were indicated the 28, I was wondering for how many came from Limpopo out of those. The budget chain, yeah, labor tenant settlement, the awards. I don't think if that is the budget, we're going to go anywhere. If even Limpopo, we are told Bahukra 8 million and now, I'm not sure that we will go anywhere. So it is a matter chair that would need an eagle's eye from this committee. And we must hear from the department today. We request the department to explain why it's not meeting all those targets that they are setting for themselves. The Mpopo only one settled, uh, claim was settled. And this is despite the ongoing challenges that our people are, are facing. The most vulnerable, the uneducated and anything that we will find on with the labor tenants. I don't even want to think about what we found on our oversight with the joint oversight with uh, uh, Department here, Labor, Employment and Labor. So I want to go to briefly on some issues from our, <clears throat> our special master. I have asked special master, or how does this affect your performance? Clapping together targets, Lady uh, Farm Dwellers. You're talking about the dream picture, grim about um, not being able to get quality according to the current situation here, yeah, legal uh, systems, how it operates. But what could be done in that instance? Because when I look at the challenges and the way forward on those last slides, it says there are challenges and you are not winning or you lack support. Can you just explain to us for what does the lost claim strategy seek to achieve? This is not even in place. It still has to be finalized. How will this work? I have indicated and bemoaned lack of uh, indicating provinces on the names of the farms that are on that slide so that you are able to see how far you are. Is this helping the whole country or is it one-sided? On your challenges, you indicate that the performance of Dalrat in resolving labor tenants claims is unacceptable. As a special master appointed by court, what recourse do you have in such instance? You also indicating that the post settlement is remarkably inadequate, remarkably. And I was thinking about the other, even your imaging farmers and everything. Now, if it's remarkably inadequate for the labor tenants, what does the department is saying to us in this one? On your way forward, you indicate that uh, there's need for approval for implementation of SOP and its practice note without delay. Who must approve so that uh, we probably address this directly with the person who's withholding the approval? We also urge the department to fully acknowledge and embrace the supervisory monitoring and oversight responsibilities that the LCC has entrusted to it. Is there resistance from the department? Are there challenges so that uh, we are able to intervene? The issue of the staff did not come out nicely as to what has been done, even on Boeing courses. 
presentation. And you only touched it when you finishing your presentation about the field work that you do, you're doing. When we went to your summit last time, we saw in pictures that you spent most of the time on the field doing field work because lack of uh, officials from Dalrat as he stands and as you rightfully say, want to hear from the department, how do you respond to that? Because despite the delay by COVID and everything, you're not sending on staff. Contracts management is not done adequately of staff and everything. But how long will this take to resolve what the special master was appointed to do if this is the snail pace that the whole process is going through? Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Tape. Honorable Ntate Masipa. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good morning, Chair, and good morning to my colleagues and uh, the ministers that are on the platform. Uh, Chair, I have concerns about the presentation by the department. Let me just say that um, the presentation really for me says nothing because it's basically just throwing the numbers and uh, it's exactly what we have received when we were on oversight, telling same story again and again. Uh, it says nothing. But what's worse, Chair, is that uh, the department seem to be telling us what we want to hear, you know, uh, the good story side, rather than really going deeper into the issues. They are not really, they just touching the surface. Uh, Chair, my worry is that when we were doing oversight, there were a number of issues in uh, Metlape uh, that joint oversight. Metlape did highlight some of the issues. And, you know, if they were not really performing to the numbers that they need to perform, but at least being able to provide the impact on the, on the areas where they have really uh, done this work. It would have been a different story. So the quantity is not there. The quality is not there. The cooperation is not there. And I mean, they, you know, it's only the special master that is talking about the lack of cooperation, the lack of working together with the department officials on the ground. But the department is not telling us that story. It tells us a good story because they believe that's what we want to hear. And I mean, uh, the chair, coming to the uh, question regarding the special master, the issue of um, a lack of cooperation. And I mean, we met with the minister and special master. The very same issues were highlighted. Uh, during our, our, when we visited the Constitutional Hill uh, place to engage with some of those farm dwellers as such. This question was raised by Special Master. My question is, what is it that is making it so difficult for the department to work with the Special Master? And uh, obviously, the big question is, what is the minister doing about it to, to really uh, resolve this? What interventions has she put in place to really ensure that this thing is working? Because, I mean, the special master is lamenting to us as the portfolio committee to say, we cannot come here and tell a good story here. But when we go to the ground, there's no good story to tell. When we are there on the field, it's a fight. And this story was the story that the special master highlighted the last time when we were there. Chair, I think uh, we've got a problem here. And uh, this thing, the way it looks, is gonna take even more than 30 years to resolve if we're not really taking hard line around this. Uh, it might really be forcing the court to come to the rescue of uh, uh, this uh, particular area to resolve again. Um, the employment contract, Metlape highlighted those things. 
the department's presentation is just looking good with regards to the employment uh, that, you know, the vacancies have been filled and so forth. But the issue that the special master is raising with regards to this employment contract um, that create a challenge each time the contract comes to an end and uh, uh, the training of those staff, um, you know, get lost due to poor employment contract and all those kind of stuff. So, I just want to know what is the department doing to address this particular gap uh, with regards to the employment contract? Uh, Prof uh, did um, indicate uh, the issue of the 150 million uh, fraudulent transaction. And he did say that um, uh, briefly what the issues were there. I just want to know if the uh, prof is prepared to really elaborate a little bit more in terms of which province, um, uh, what is the kind of activities that are happening on that particular farm, uh, you know, in terms of uh, if there's a possibility of a recourse uh, by the department and ensuring that the dignity of this uh, people that are affected by this a fraudulent transaction can be restored. Uh, Chair, that's it from my side. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Masipo, the Honorable Treater. Honorable Treater. You are muted. Uh, uh, greetings to the minister, members of parliament, um, of the portfolio committee, and um, the officials of the department, and greetings to the spe uh, special master. Chair, uh, listening attentively to the presentation by both the department and the special master, it is quite um, uh, 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 obvious to me that there is no cordial um, uh, 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 relationship or working relationship between the two. And that is of a serious concern. Um, and as that, as, as it may be, uh, it affects the most uh, vulnerable people, which are the labor tenants. Now, Chair, I won't repeat what has been uh, highlighted, but I want to ask uh, the special master this one question. For 2022, 2023, there has been a very very snail, not even slow pace of settling um, the, the, the labor tenant applications. That is why you were brought on board to assist the department to fast track this, uh, 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 the claims of labor tenants, just focusing on labor tenants. What is the difference now between what was the problem then and what is the problem now with your existence in the to assist? Because so, as much as I hear the problems, the challenges that the labor, the special master is facing, and his money solutions, the claims were lost. There's a system that is proposed in place. It's been a year now. It's been over a year, if I'm not mistaken, when we went to, to visit the Constitutional Hill. You can put systems for a year of tracing e e e e e e land claims, labor tenant claims that were lost. Yes, it is a remedial uh, 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 way or proposal. But what are the, the remedial actions proposed 
to the people to make sure that there is, they, maybe I'm expecting something that seeks to say, these are the claims that we identify that to have been lost in these areas. Let's go back to those people so that they can relog their claims. Now we find ourselves having people, labor tenants that are seated there waiting, waiting for the department to, 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 to finalize the, the student, their claim. And the special master himself reported that these people are old. Some of them are dying in the process. How many must they die before their claims are finalized? There are certain issues Chair, that I just want to, 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 to share in the meeting. There are certain issues of our societal, of, of soci there are certain matters of societal issues that we, we just enjoy. cannot just tick a box. We can't just tick boxes when it comes to certain issues that matters the most one. Second, Chair, we know that there are pending cases in Bumalang, if not as a pending case, that involves the, that is currently in court, that relates to the issue of Imitlaba. Is it the same case that we are reported of, or is it a different case? Hence, I would like to, 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 to also align myself with um, the latter speaker that seeks to take. Can we, give any, can we be given a detail on which part of Mbomalanga and the areas and, and, and a bit of detail, which land are they, are they referring to? The last question shared to the special master, You are having these challenges. You were appointed based on clear mandate and clear uh, 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 to do list, I will say. <laughs> now it's not happening. What channels should you be uh, following? To, to, to solve these problems. Because Tina, we want solutions. As much as we also want problems and challenges so that we can assist and do our oversight. We need not forget each other's boundaries and each other's mandate when we do our work. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Charter. The Honorable Ndade uh, Matiasa. Um, Fouke. Do me Ndade Matiasa? Akbar Ebriyad. Akbare Bread, the Honorable Kappa. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning to you, Chair, to the Minister and Deputy Ministers, the Department and my colleagues, and the Special Master. And also thank you for the presentation, for both presentations. First, let me start to the department chair. It's just a few, 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 a few points. That in this process, the department, do they have any relation or interaction with, or a need of that interactional relation with the Department of Employment and Labor, who are usually there uh, in participating in these processes uh, on these lands? Uh, secondly, again, on the department, 
there is a, a mention by the special master on the delay on the approval of standard operations procedure. Uh, I would like to understand why, what is the delay in, in uh, approving these procedures, which to me seems are necessary or important for special master. Also to the department, I would like to understand if there are any programs or any of their programs that relate to this process. If you make an example of a uh, food security and other benefits that go to the people on the land, they, they have any, and are they implementing those in assistance? Uh, the special master also mentioned the, that they have a link with, uh, I mean, communication with the, 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 the clients and have a database. It would be interesting to know exactly what is the mode of interaction with this with these clients, and also linked to that is the reaction of the landowners, which one can expect that it, it can be they can be a, an obstacle in this process, and therefore also identify what also uh, special master has mentioned about the section twenty five of the constitution. If this means that, do, do this mean, does this mean that there must be a process of revoking the section 25 in order to fast track or overcome the processes that are being encountered with the landowners there? Lastly, this one was touched also by Honorable Massif, I think, this one of fraud, fraudulent transactions. Here, yeah, I'm interested in whether there has been any process of recovering those amounts that's that's a huge amount and also that is there anything that is happening are there any people held accountable for these millions uh chair i think for now these are areas that i wanted to get clarity on i thank you thank you honorable tapa uh, honorable babama Uh, good morning, Chair, and uh, greetings to everyone on the platform. Um, Chair, it, in December 2023, the Special Master would have finished four years of his tenure. And obviously, then next year, with the five-year term, you know, his, his term will be ending. And I am really worried that uh, at the amount of work that has not been done, during the four years that he has been here. However, I would, I would like to commend him, especially on um, uncovering the fraud and also on his work on the ground, despite the fact that um, he didn't have, uh, um, you know, many people assisting him to do that. Chair, um, I wonder if the department has actually looked at the other um, at the at the other uh, you know the other provinces like Free State, Northern Cape, Northwest, and and ask themselves why they don't have any applications lodged from from those uh, provinces. I would really like them to address that in their response. Why do they think they did not receive any, uh, uh, um, you know, any any applications from those provinces? Because there must be labor tenants in those farms, in those in in, in especially Free State, you know, uh, Northern Cape. We actually went there, and I cannot understand why there are no applications. Just as an aside, and then chair, I would like to go to. Um, slide number 15. And sorry, Chair, I'm just looking at my notes here. When you look at slide number, number 15, we understand that the special master is playing an important monitoring and oversight role on behalf of the land claims court. We also note the explanation in slide 15 
about this discrepancy in relation to the targets of the department versus those in the implementation plan. And the department says that this matter will be addressed during the next LCC hearing on progress in the implementation of the court order. Now, in my view, the explanation provided, that is to choose to explain itself to the court undermines the accountability and oversight function of parliament as provided for in section 5552 of the constitution. We just want to remind the executive that they account to parliament. It is this parliament that ap appropriated the funds for the implementation plan via the department. So the, the department is welcome to address the court, but it must not undermine parliament's oversight role. And uh, the next thing that I'd like to bring up here, um, even though it has been brought up by um, most of my colleagues, is the, uh, the lack of performance on the targets. And I would just like the department to explain to me why would they have a separate operating target from from the, from the targets that they had initially. For an example, in the four years from 2020 to 2023, they had a target of, they should have had a target of 4,000. But if you look at the, at the operation plan, they have a target of 2,416. Could they give me an explanation on that? And lastly, Chair, I would just like to know what is the delay? What is causing the delay? In, uh, in the SOP being approved. Maybe uh, the minister can come in there, I'm not sure, because I would, I would assume that it is her approval that is uh, lacking. And also I'd like to commend the prof again for um, highlighting the fact that there are problems between him and the department because every other word he spoke about was they were bickering, there's, uh, they, they must stop arguing, you know, they must uh, drop their egos, et cetera, et cetera. And I really think that the minister must come in here and, and try and resolve this problem. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Kangeba, uh, uh, the Honorable Memasho. Uh, Good morning, Chair. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. You may proceed. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairperson, good morning to you and to the minister and deputy ministers present, uh, my colleagues, officials of the department, uh, uh, led by Ndeta Ramasodi. Uh, Chairperson, let me welcome the presentation as presented, both of them. On the issue raised by, uh, by Honorable Klape and Honorable Masipa, I fully uh, concur with them. I'm not going to repeat them. That the issue of intergovernmental relations on this matter of uh, the department not called, uh, working together, the, on the issue of relation, working relationship, uh, I think it's important for both the department and the office of the, the, the special master to make sure that the issue of uh, cooperation need to be addressed as a matter of agency uh, by, by developing the working tool and which, that, which will uh, let them track and monitor and evaluation the performance of everyone in the department together in the, in the office of the special master. The implementation of bookkeeping in a uh, bookkeeping method, which will 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 allow us to 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 do, to do our work uh, as oversiders, as lawmakers, so that when we do the oversight on them, we can be able to see uh, the things that they have done. Unlike to come and lament that we are not working together, we don't want to hear the issue of not working together. Because the, the 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 special master's office is meant to help the department to implement certain things. That is why they are there. 
My understanding in bookkeeping chairperson is that the segment of the work accounting system, bookkeeping is the basics of the accounting, and it is also contains the proper record of all work done by the officials in both the department and the office of the special master. That will then allow uh, the issue of classification and proper, uh, proper, a proper proper check on who is not doing the work because presently if they come here and say we are not agreeing it does not mean that uh, we, we should just say the department is not agreeing is there any document in place in did you keep any documents that says on this day this is what i did this is the one person who did not sign this is the one person who did not process there is nothing we are just told that we are not uh, having a good working relationship of which it's one of the things that we don't want to hear as leaders here on this platform. We need concrete information from both the department and, and, and the, the office of the special master. They need to work together. They are not there to work for themselves. It's to help our communities out there because when we were doing oversight in the in all nine provinces, we realized that things are not going well. And we are lamenting on this issue every day. And I don't think it's something that we are going to agree to Person. And really, I am not really happy uh, with the, the technocrats when they have this information where they, they know what to do and they come and tell us they're not working together. What is it? Thank you, Chair. Honorable Montredi. Eh, Kalebo Hamudula Stilo, Madume, who were Nalebatanella Copanon Botley. Mudula Stilo, key, oh, slide eight of the presentation by the department, they are raising issues, saying that there are challenges of processing Yadi Casey to court is due to the very slow. Is low due to capacity issues in the state attorney's office. Now, that statement on their presentation, I want to link it with uh, the content that I saw on the implementation plan. Uh, and I think it's in, in line with paragraph six, your court order chair, dated October 29, uh, 2019, where court requested that the implementation plan to be submitted to the LCC should include the following information. Number one, I'm just going to mention one, an assessment of the skill pool and other infrastructure required. Let's just leave it here where they're speaking of the skill pool. Why are we still having issues of capacity now when it was clear in that implementation plan that an assessment yeah, the skill pool should be done? so that uh, we know what is it that we have. So, so I just want to find out from the department is, does this mean that the court order was not fully complied with, where an assessment in terms of the skills required was not done, so that uh, proper interventions should be made in order to deal with that issue. Now, the other issue, Chair, still on the issue of the capacity. From the side of the special master, if you can maybe indicate what capacity do they think they need in order for the office to be able to deal with the work at the hand so that we see quicker finalization and processing of matters as they come before the court, uh, the special master chair. Now, the other issue chair is that uh, there are issues of lost claims and uh, saying uh, there's no reliable data with regard to uh, labor tenants in for there and there. I want to check what is the plan in place of dealing with, with that. And the fact that, that there's no reliable data, it means they, they, they may still have to go back to claimants or claimants may still be able to approach the office and say, here's the data in order for us to support our claim. So how are they going to deal with that chair? And also, does that also open up, does that also open up for people that could not submit their claims by 2001 to be given an opportunity to support, to submit their claims chair. And then uh, the other thing is with regard to the appointment of the special master that was done for a period of five years. 
uh, what will happen if the special master will not be able to finalize the work allocated within that period of five years? What is it that is going to happen in terms of dealing with that particular thing? And then the other thing, Chair, is that uh, can the department provide a list of the 28 farms uh, with uh, 577 level tenants identified as in the pipeline uh, to be implemented? Can we really get that? And then the last issue, or the second last issue, Chair, is of the fraudulent transactions. I think Honorable Masipa covered me with uh, regard to that question. The last question, Chair, that I just want to put, there's a guy who normally sends us emails, uh, and I think it may be relevant for one to ask it here, is in Tadesu Futsa Ulo who was asking, when is the 368 kilometer in diameter of land claims of Bakwena Ba Mare Apohole due to be finalized and settled? And, and when is the community due for relocation? As this matter was long uh, submitted to the court around 2009 or 2008, somewhere there. What that Dr. Mandela Kelebo ha eh Kelebo Hill? Baba Mwaba Red or Nahori Honorable members, let us uh, <clears throat> take the opportunity to invite uh, the Honorable Kruger. Uh, chair. Chair. You may proceed, Honorable Kruger. Uh, chair is uh, Honorable Masipa. Yes, Dr. Masipa. Uh, Honorable Kruger is not available. He uh, uh, tendered uh, an apology. He's attending right. the. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Honorable Kappa. The Honorable Kappa. Yes, I'm here, Chair. Yes. No, I don't have anything to say at the moment. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Akbar Ebriad. Honorable members, any other honorable member on the platform who may wish to pose a question I have not uh, been able to recognize? Good morning. Yes, you may proceed. Akbar uh, Yes, good morning, Chair. Good morning to colleagues. Just a very brief input, and I I am just um just about the legal issues. Um, I think, Chair, that the what the master, the special master indicates about the state attorney and the legal aid board is deeply concerning, given the importance of litigation in these issues. And I would uh, recommend to the committee that you might want to consider a briefing by the Department of Justice, by the State Attorney's Office, by the Legal Aid Board at some stage with the master at the same time, who could then raise his concerns. Um, I just wanted to make that small comment from my side as a suggestion, as a possible way forward, because that's at the heart of all these issues. And I can really understand both from the department side and from the special master that there is an issue relating to establishing legal precedents and it is capacity constraints in both the state attorney's office and the legal aid board. Chair, you might remember that the, um, that the legal services was moved at one stage from the department to the Department of Justice and the budget as well. And I would just be deeply concerned if the department is not able to meet its aims and targets and the special master if there's a lack of capacity from the Department of Justice. It's just a very short comment from my side, Chair. I hope it's helpful. Thank you, uh, Honorable Swart. Honorable members, any other honorable member on the platform who may wish to pose a question?
If not, allow me, the four honorable members, to pose a few of the questions I was able to note from the presentations put before us. Uh, the presentation, particularly on the special master's role, in our understanding, honorable members, the special master has been given five years to do the work as directed by the courts. Can the special master confirm if it is so? In this analysis uh, of the special master, the work of the department and in his projections, Will the department be able to finish all labor tenant claims within the time frame as directed by the court? And if not, what is it that is needed to achieve this? On the budget allocation for awards to settle labor tenants, honorable members, we have asked the information about the separation of the budget last year even before the joint oversight. During the presentation in September, the committee reiterated a need to show the budget for the awards made to settle labor tenants' claims. Today, uh, Uba Uzulu has reported that there is a process in place. It is eight months since we requested this information. We also just considered the budget for 2023-2024. And there is no reason why the department could not address this question in the new budget. Honorable members, can the department explain why it takes more than eight months to separate the budget for labor tenant application from the general tenure budget? This is important given the court order in this regard. From the special master's point of view, honorable members, has the department complied with court requirement for budget allocation for the awards made to settle labor tenants claims? We are concerned because it is lumped together with all tenure reform projects and we are unable to do our oversight work on this aspect as we have been told, in, it includes Esther, Trankra, and other tenure reform legislations. Honorable members on skills audit and capacity challenges, even since we started this committee, the department has always been reporting about fit for purpose structure. It's almost five years today, the department still says it has a finalized fit for purpose structure. When is it this structure going to be implemented? Why is it not being implemented? Perhaps the question honorable members to the special master is in his monitoring work, what are his observations with regard to fit for purpose structure for tenure reform? Does it respond to the special master's skills audit outcomes? And in regards to pace for settlement, which is not satisfactory. In Limpopo, honorable members, we visited Maitia and uh, Mashaela families. Thankfully, Mr. Zulu was present with us on the both occasions. The Limpopo officials mentioned that those cases were to be settled by the end of the financial year. Now, when you look at the stats for Limpopo, it is still one claim. What happened to the Mashaela family who claim, whose claim was at convincing stage in June 2022 when we visited Limpopo? And with regards to land claim strategy, to date, honorable members, what is the amount of lost claims and untraceable claims that the department knows of? What has the department done with the lost claims to date? That would be all on my side, honorable members. We'll now hand back to the uh, department for responses and then to the special master. Thank you. 
Honorable Minister. Thank you, Chairperson. I will ask the department to respond to those specific questions. Um, thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Minister, uh, Honorable Chair, and all members of the Portfolio Committee, uh, Deputy Ministers on the platform, and um, the colleagues. May I request that um, the first bite be from uh, Ndate Zulu, followed by Ndate Ndove, and I will deal with the other issues that were raised by the Honorable Members. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members, uh, for the questions. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, combine those that are similar uh, in terms of the responses. Uh, firstly, maybe let me start with the the issue of which I think the the the, the DG will also add more on the issue of the capacity and the process around the finalization of the fit for purpose structure for the entire department. However, uh, as I alluded in my in the presentation, from the side of uh, uh, the Kenya in, in particular, uh, we had a session, uh, we have finalized the, the, the fit for paper structure as a, as a, for Kenya to try and close all the gaps that we have identified, uh, including the capacity that is required for, for the implementation of this particular program, program the labor tenants. So that is currently available, and obviously it has to go in uh, together with the finalization of the fit for paper structure for the entire department. However, the DG will add on that particular one. With regards to the issue of the contract positions, as I've mentioned in the email, the we have written to and I'm hopeful that the DG can also add uh, because this matter is handled by our HR in the department, uh, which they have written to to DPSA to get authority, uh, authorization firstly for the national program manager, which we have recently appointed uh, this one uh, in, 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 in March this year, uh, uh, already started. However, also, the only approval that we could obtain was only for 12 months. And we're waiting for the approval to get the, the national program manager for labor tenants to, 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 for a longer period, or, or even at least in line with the term of the, of the special master. was the fact that uh, uh, originally from this program, we had a, pro a national program manager, which we have struggled to, to, to appoint. And eventually we have the, the national program manager. On the other ones in the Umalanga, as I've mentioned, the, a similar situation has happened. We're only allowed to appoint them for a period of 12 months while we are finalizing the fit for purpose structure and the creation of such positions in the, in, the, in the establishment of the department. That is where we are. However, we said we're not going to sit back. Uh, we, while we waiting for the approval of the entire structure for the department, uh, including the, the tenure uh, reform, we obviously have to do something with regards to the current, the existing contract positions, which our HR is handling. The, the other matter, if we, maybe the special master can give more details, but the ones that, we, the only matter that has come to our knowledge with regards to the, 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 that case that the special master referred to, if is the same case, 
The, that matter is with the internal audit as we speak. Um, however, maybe the special master can give more details on that matter. But that the one that we are aware of, it just relates, it was not in relation to the implementation of the labor tenancy. It was like a farm worker scheme at the time. And, and, and what we discovered is that those farm workers, some of them, in, the, in terms of what the, the project was about, they were labor tenants, which in terms of the, the, the obligations, we still have an obligation to secure that labor tenant claim, which is, would be part, which is part of our claim that we still need to settle in terms of the Labor Tenancy Act. The issue around the, the APP, which has been raised by honorable members across the board, the APP targets, the, 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 we, we, we will obviously come back to the portfolio, to the committee to advise them. But because this was what we, we the, the, our, our understanding was that we need to appraise the court in terms of what they have approved in the, in the implementation plan. Because the reality on the ground now, as we have alluded to, um, does not put us in a position to align our annual targets from now uh, with what was approved in the implementation plan in terms of the numbers. We have uh, reflected those numbers in terms of the implementation plan, as you have seen uh, presented uh, by myself, and also the what is the current, the final uh, targets that we consolidated from provinces based on the on a number of issues that we have explained uh, and the special master has explained. On the other matter on the standard operating procedures, we agreed with the special master on a process, which, which we have already embarked on that process. What is left now, one of those processes was to take the standard operating procedures and workshop provincial officials that are implementing the, 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 the labor tenants, which we have done and finalized. Now, as per our agreement with the DDG responsible for operations in the Office of the Special Master, we agreed that we are now going to have a final workshop on the on the on the standard operating procedures because there are some areas which we fl flagged as a department uh, which obviously timber into which i think the special master has also alluded to timber into the administrative functions of the dg which we need to clarify because in our view the dgs in terms of the act also still has those delegations. If anything goes wrong, the question will come to the DG. So we are trying to make sure that we align to what the Act says the DG, the delegations to the DG are and the delegations for the minister are as we do the as we do the amendment in the in the in the SOPs, which are going to be finalized as soon as we, we finalize the final workshop where as agreed with the Office of the Special Master. The the other matter on the which has been raised, which is similar across, is the issue around the, the, the lost claims. The issue, the, the, the lost claims and the database. The, the figures that we have, as I have mentioned, the, there was a process that was embarked on, it was a campaign, which then consolidated all the applications that were received per province. However, when we, after we received all the information from that campaign, uh, there were service providers that were, uh, that were appointed across the country to deal with the collection of the information which were running the campaign on farms and they received these applications. And also what we noticed when we finalized was that 
at the time, the service providers were not using standard a standard application for for, 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 for the lodgement of applications. The figures that we have, they come from a database, which in our view is the basis of the numbers that we have as the numbers that we are setting. And we are working towards against those numbers. Yes, indeed, in terms of the, 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 num the, the, the actual section 17 notices, there is a database, you find that there is a database which consolidate, but you might not find a section 17 notice, which is the application, yet the person up, up, uh, is, up, is, is reflected on the database. The issue of the database vis-a-vis -vis the actual section systems, that was the issue that we, we had to, to verify, which we have verified. Our view is that we are fine with that, although as we implement, we find that, like the special master has said, we find on a particular farm that instead of, I'll just make one example, where we had 44 applications that we have in terms of session system, only to find that when we did the very actual verification, we discovered that they are indeed 45. But when you check in our database, you will find the name of the person. So it's just that, 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 that we define as not necessarily, we say it is genuinely, genuinely lost. It doesn't appear anywhere in even our database or anywhere in our records, but you might not find a section system, which is easy to, 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 to deal with in that case. But sometimes you will find that this person has lodged a debatting game, this proof. Therefore, as we implement, we then add. In terms of the numbers, uh, the, working with the special mass, the numbers of those that we said they might have been lost or untraceable, those numbers are not that significant as we as we as we, we talk about it. But however, we agreed to say let's have a loss claim strategy as we come across such uh, applications. We've got a process on how to deal with them without opening. Um, the, 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 the lodgement because it closed according to the act, it was uh, extended to 31st, uh, to 2001, 31st uh, of, of, of December 2001. Then what that was it. So we cannot again open for, 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 for the lodgement of the labor tenant claims. We are settling what is outstanding as we speak now. If we come across those that we've got evidence that yes, there was a labor tenant claim. That, that is why the figures will see slight changes in such figures. In terms of the, the, the claim that uh, we spoke about from um, the Limpopo province, uh, the special master was also, also add on there in terms of their processes. However, the, that, that particular farm, the, the honorable chairperson is talking about, in terms of settlement, it is reprioritized for 2023-24 on the seventy labor tenant claims that are prioritized for the for for the Lipopo province, while working on the pipeline projects uh, that are there, which are going to be referred to court. What we what we have seen in Limpopo in terms of their database, all the three hundred and forty seven, uh, only seventy where we have received some kind of a positive response from the landowners. The rest are, are currently going to be referred to court, all of those cases of the 345, the balance of the 345. So that is the process that we are embarking on with the province of Limpopo in trying to refer those cases following the new processes that uh, the special master has spoken about. The skills assessment was done, skills audit, but the special master will also uh, talk to that particular matter in detail. The, the separation of the budget, um, uh, we, as I've mentioned, uh, the matter, we have raised it uh, with the, the, our CFO to look into how we deal with that particular matter. What, what is going to happen is that they will create a responsibility uh, item 
uh, which will be talking to the labor tenants, uh, which is a, 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 a the part that needs the financial, uh, the CFO and the finance people in the department to, to advise us and, and create that responsibility in our budget. However, the issue of the budget, as the honorable members have seen, it has not been an issue in terms of the expenditure and we run short of the budget. Uh, I think it's a matter of alignment, like the honorable chairperson have said, uh, for award of, of for labor tenants. Maybe let me stop there if I have missed some um, uh, important uh, issues. And I think DDG um, and Nobe will, will talk to that in with regards to the working relationship between the department, especially the branch, our branch responsible for the implementation of labor tenants and the special master. What is it that we have done? What is it that we have proposed? Uh, other matters that we have dealt with in, in the land terms court with the, with the judge. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. Bound over, you can proceed. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Chair, and my greetings to the Minister, um, Deputy Ministers, um, the committee, and my fellow colleagues. Uh, I think Mr. Zulu has covered uh, a bigger area in terms of responding to the questions that have been raised by the members. Um, Maybe I should just go straight to what he has indicated uh, as his closing remarks, although he break, uh, I don't know whether there's something else that you could have said that I have not heard, but I think what of importance is issues related to relationship uh, uh, between the department uh, and the special master and the support uh, to the special master's work in the department. Um, I, I, I don't want to play down uh, that that the, 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 the everything's fine. Uh, but from my side, I don't know of any serious uh, uh, problems with regard to the relationship between ourselves and the office of the special master. I personally work very closely with the office of the special master and um, on all areas where we need to work together. Um, of course, um, I don't mean that there will be no some operational challenges here and there, but I will not describe our relationship as a bad relationship and that there's no cooperation from the department um, in terms of supporting the work of the special master. Um, since the, 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 they came to the department. However, unless uh, maybe the special master will, will elaborate on the, 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 the areas that are very difficult between ourselves and them, but as far as I'm concerned, on all issues that uh, uh, um, emerged, um, um, whether from the field or in terms of um, issues that we need to agree upon or, or issues related to support to their work, we have always been cooperating and, and working together. Of course, there are some difficulties, like it has come out clearly that um, with regard to issues uh, related to capacity, it has been, it's not something that can be sorted out overnight, but we've been working very closely with them and assuring them and also assuring court in terms of the difficulties that we have, but also the efforts that we're putting in place to address such difficulties um, that we are experiencing um, uh, in that regard. And I think Mr. Zulu has, has, has already indicated uh, that uh, sufficiently. And we have even made a, a commitment, which is a commitment that the special master has accepted that at no given time, that there will be a lack of shortage of capacity, whether it is a full time or whether it is a, a, in a form of a contract, but will ensure that what happened in the past where some contract lapse 
um, and there was a bit of a period in between. It's not going to happen. And, and HR is working very closely with us to ensure that we maintain the capacity that we have. Um, and in some other areas, uh, we have actually even transformed what was contract uh, 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 workers into permanent workers, meaning that the issue of capacity in that regard. But obviously, um, the work of um, that we have in, in tenure and, and specifically in this case, uh, being the focus being in labor tenant uh, is a work that will obviously uh, demand a certain level of capacity, which we are trying to um, address at all given times. And obviously, like he has indicated, we've already done our own analysis uh, informed by the needs for labor tenants, uh, a structure that we believe um, um, as the process unfolds from the department, we will be able to implement that. So we are working on that, obviously, but we cannot wait until when the fit for purpose is, is finalized, we are also trying to make sure that we do have capacity because the need to address challenges are now, we're not going to wait for, for the fit for, fit for purpose. So I, I, I really, uh, 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 honorable members and, and minister that uh, I, 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 I don't know how, how to uh, uh, respond properly with the issues that it's becoming clear in this meeting, like there's a serious problem with the relationship or cooperation between ourselves and the, and the special master. And, and that is not what I'm feeling uh, unless it is explained differently. Of course, like I indicated earlier on. Um, the, the, the special master uh, uh, amongst challenges uh, indicated the issue of the uh, supervising, uh, monitoring, as well as the oversight role, which is the key function of the special master. Uh, and, and with agreement with us uh, as a department, um, went to court, I'm talking about the LCC, to say maybe we need also to unpack it because the, the, there's sometimes different uh, understanding as to uh, to what extent should this function be done. And that does not constitute that there's a, there's a problem. But I think it was just very clear it, it, it is important that it becomes clear to both of us. And that was a, a, um, a, a mutual understanding amongst ourselves. Because like, like what Mr. Zula have said, that the, the, the ruling did not took powers from the DG in terms of the prescripts or legislation that the DG is responsible for, including labor tenants. So, but however, we need to work with the special master to ensure that they assist the department to resolve this uh, outstanding uh, labor uh, tenant uh, claims. So in the process, obviously, there could be some little bit of um, overlapping or different uh, understanding as to, to what extent. And, 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 and my view is what the special master said in this meeting, that they are talking about quality assurance. And I believe quality assurance is, is something that cannot be disputed. Uh, that they, they have to play a quality assurance role as well in, term, in terms of uh, uh, fulfilling their functions. I don't think that that, that, is, that can be uh, disputed. So, 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 but I will never characterize that again as something that we are differing uh, 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 and, and that affects our, our relationship. I think I should stop there and allow DJ to, to, to make his comment. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Um, quite a few issues that maybe I would like to pause at, and I'll go through the questions that were asked just to ensure that um, I have fully covered the, the areas. And I think the issue around capacity has been um, outlined by Ms. Dandove, but there are a few things that I want to say around capacity. Because um, in the responses that we had from the colleagues, um, we have given the commitment, we have given assurances that at no time would this area of work have no um, officials who are attending to it. But I just needed to also reflect that according to my understanding, what the special master is having here is a project 
And there are three determinants that would be applicable here. Is the scope, which is uh, at this moment looking at the areas around labor tenants. We know the number of claims that are outstanding. And um, there is the budget issue that uh, the honorable chair of this committee had raised. And there's also time in terms of the length of time. Now, any tinkering with any of this would either extend the time or the budget, including the budget that we are having. And at this moment, um, with the rate at which we are going, um, I don't foresee us uh, completing this work together with the special master within the stipulated time. And therefore, there has got to be an engagement in terms of then throwing resources towards ensuring that this work um, is completed within a particular time frame that we have not had time to reflect on with the special master. But talking about the human resources, I think because this is a project with a definite end time, um, one would not throw all of the permanent resources to it because after that you have got to then see what do you do with the resources, then you have got to reskill, retrain, and it's always best that you have got a, a hybrid system that would allow you to deal with the issues around capacity and flexibility with an outlook of the end of the project that at the end of the project, you are not settled with uh, resources that you might not necessarily need in that area, uh, but you can be able then to start with uh, focusing on the resources in areas where the department would be requiring uh, time um, within this. I think Mr. Zulwini's uh, input had highlighted the issue around uh, the other areas of work where we are. Uh, in terms of Esther and others, and saying to the portfolio committee that there's quite a lot of work that we have in and around this area um, of tenure in the department, and we are oblivious in terms of the engagements that we need to be broadly dealing with, uh, capacitating this area and having quite a lot of capacity to deal uh, with the areas outlined. Uh, to the effect that the minister had um, in our own engagements um, even sent out um, an indication to this regard that in our fit for people structure we must deal uh, with this area, which leads me to the engagements on the fit for people structure. Now, any restructuring process in government has got to be done within the confines of the framework that we have. That framework includes the involvement of labor um, representatives or, or unions in this matter, where we have got to ensure that the framework on transformation or restructuring of the department takes every issue into consideration. And any misstep that is taken in this process would just serve uh, to um, reel the work backwards. Um, uh, this very same framework um, would need to provide for a few areas that if, if the end game would lead to us redeploying or retraining or even having alternative employment for the colleagues, this are clearly spelled out. To this effect, um, we have had challenges um, with the um, labor and rightfully so from their side, there were a few issues that they wanted the management to clarify. We have since clarified them and the process will be continuing um, as uh, per the uh, engagements that we had at the departmental bargaining chamber. But that would mean that um, we have got to compress the timelines for the fit for people structure. And I don't see that structure uh, based on the discussions and the delays that we have had. Uh, taking effect um, before the 1st of April next year. The, the, there is an element that was raised around the, maybe to, to a greater extent, and I think the colleagues have, uh, have indicated where the issues are. And from my side, I don't have any challenges in terms of engagements with the special master. Uh, however, it would be remiss of me if I don't recognize that there have been areas where the special master would raise areas that I needed to, 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 to then respond to and address. And we have agreed on a program on how do we uh, deal with those issues and address them. But it's part and parcel of a, a system that in the past would not have had 
a level of uh, intervention that the courts have brought into the department and it has got to be understood in that context. But what you are doing in the department is to ensure that um, the department is not beyond reproach. We ensure that each and every person within the department knows that the special master has got three trusts um, that they have got to perform within the department. And we should allow the special master to do those functions without any level of um, uh, uh, draw, drawbacks that we, we we would have in any system. So uh, this issue around the, the relationship with a special master, I think um, it might be brought to attention in terms of the, the areas before, but I can say from where I'm sitting, I've seen quite a lot of changes and I've seen quite a lot of movement in the area. Chairperson, we, we, we would like to pause here in terms of our uh, responses. Uh, the colleagues have responded uh, to the other areas that um, were asked by the honorable members of this portfolio committee. Thank you. Thank you, DJ. And I invite the honorable minister. Just before the honorable minister. Yes, uh, DM Spacher. Just one second, Chair. I wanted to say it would be like the DG says, it would be remiss of me since the question was directly asked by members of the committee about the role that the minister has played in trying to resolve whatever is perceived as a friction between the special master and the department. I just wanted to say in one line that uh, directed by the minister and agreeing with the DG and the GDG that, uh, and the special master that uh, the issues are not <clears throat> uh, at a level of antagonism. But when the minister observed that there were, as the special master does raise the issues, she then directed me to see that we attend to these issues. And I just wanted, I felt that one should report to the portfolio committee that at the end of March, I convened a meeting with the DG, the special master, the DDGs and senior management of the office of the department to deal with these issues, uh, considering the importance as honorable church has indicated of the task at hand so that we are not sidetracked by these issues. I felt that I should just add that before the minister comes in. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. The Honorable Deputy Minister Squatcher, that was a very long line. Thank you for the input. Uh, Honorable Minister Mahmoud Visa. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. I think uh, Deputy Minister and the team have covered the question. I just want to deal with one issue that relates to legal support. You would recall, Chairperson, that uh, in the fifth administration, we had a facility uh, for legal support within the department. And at the engagement with the land claims court uh, judges in particular, who felt that the quality of legal support that we were giving was not um, adequate, rather up to scratch, let me put it that way, because it was not the issue of adequacy. At the engagement with themselves and the Department of Justice, there was agreement that such a facility should move and be mainstream within the Department of uh, Justice, which is within the legal service, uh, the legal aid board. And we have been working with them to ensure that necessary uh, support is given to the, you know, land beneficiaries. These would either be farm workers or uh, labor tenants. It is having its teething problem at the moment. And we acknowledge that we've been having actually the meeting with the five judges of the land claims course in the past two weeks. Again, looking at some of these uh, matters of uh, quality in terms of the presentation in the court by uh, the legal representatives. And we have raised those matters 
with the Department of Justice as well. So, so that Mr. Call Brian, I was just giving input. So that the Solicitor General can actually look at uh, these matters of the briefings of attorneys that uh, have to undertake this task. So just to assure the committee that these matters are being looked into. With regard to the issues of capacity, we do agree that we need to beef up that matter within the broad context as well also of the uh, wage bill in government. So as you would know that the compensation of employees has been one of the issues that has been raised about the bloated structure of government in general. So what we've been looking also is how do we repurpose and ensure that we have a structure that will be able to have adequate capacity to do the work at hand that it's supposed to be done without necessarily bloating the structure such that the COE becomes more than resources that go for operational. Otherwise, Chair, I am okay with the responses that have been given thus far. And noting as well, the concerns that members have raised about how we collectively with the special master ensure that we move with the necessary speed to resolve the matters of the labor tenants. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister Umamu Didiza. Let us uh, take uh, responses from the special master. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson, uh, Deputy Ministers, Honorable Members, uh, colleagues from the department. Um, <clears throat> A lot of questions have been posed and I will do my best to answer all of them. <clears throat> Excuse me, one, one issue which came up several times is the, the matter which is reflected in the budget structure. And that is the, the combination of farm dwellers and labor tenants. This for me is a problem. Um, it's, it's, it's equal a problem of the budget, although the expression one finds on the ground might be a reflection of the fact that they are combined in budgetary terms. Now, labor tenants have specific rights. That is how the law is written. Um, whether or not laws need to be amended is way beyond my remit, but certainly labor tenants have specific rights in land, which I believe can be quantified, and that's what we are doing. It's not even that complicated, and it doesn't need to be all that long. Uh, we do also need additional dedicated capacity in the NGI in order to achieve this. Um, but when you combine them, you dilute those labor tenants' rights, and you also play to the whims of the farmer, because I've seen this clearly in a number of cases on the ground, several, several, I can give a lot of cases, which I haven't even, which are not part of the 28 farms. Um, and that is a situation whereby a farmer wants to solve the issue of people on his farm. And then... Um, with the department, we end up find a, finding a situation where labor tenant claims are resolved, um, farm dweller issues are dealt with, and a whole lot of people are combined in one CPA on a farm. Now, that is what one is finding as a major problem because it dilutes the rights of labor tenants. So I think that is something that I have spoken to the DG about it before. And I think increasingly, if we are going to... If, try and use land acquisition to step up the pace, then we need to be very, very cautious about the way in which we do this. Um, let me say that in, in uh, the parliament of uh, the National Assembly of the Republic of South Africa in 2005, an NGO called Nkuzi Development Association made a submission on farm worker evictions. And they presented before parliament a number of 4.2 million farm workers who had been uh, displaced, relocated, removed, whatever words we use for it, uh, between uh, 1994 and 2005. Now that is a remarkable number and working on the ground, I, I, would, I cannot attest to those figures which haven't really been contested. 
but certainly it's a reflection of the reality of what goes on in these farms. And that's another problem of combining different categories uh, in the law as defined. And that is people have been moved from high agro uh, land with high agroecological potential onto, onto rocks, literally, like uh, we, we find in the famous song by Ladysmith Black Mambazo. And people are living on rocks. And, and when you settle people on rocks and give them whatever the hectare is, you are not resolving a land claim where people historically have act, had access to high potential land for cropping as well as high potential land for um, cattle rearing. So I think these are realities that we need to face. Um, and that is... We, we, when we have these discussions, we discuss, we, we acting as though there are no landowners in this picture. And that once we put them in the picture, we also begin to have a different analysis, which I'd like the honor, honorable members to consider as well. Um, on the legal support, what I would recommend, um, given this extraordinary intervention, and it's correct, it's an extraordinary intervention. It hasn't happened in South Africa before that we've had an institution known as a special master. It, it exists in other jurisdictions. In, in our implementation plan, we talk about those kind of, of, of interventions internationally in order to draw on, on best practice in what we are trying to achieve here. Uh, the, 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 the fact of the matter is that I think, uh, notwithstanding all the explanations which I understand around legal support, Given the extraordinary nature of this intervention, we should ring fence part of the existing budget for legal support. And this should be managed by myself uh, together with the department in order to really engage in the impact litigation uh, until such time as we see a greater readiness. I can give individual cases. I drove the whole way from Johannesburg to um, to Newcastle. I, I picked up a labor tenant claimant in, in um, Utrecht, and we, we went to the office, um, uh, the application forms were submitted there, and from then it took five weeks uh, to actually get acknowledgement that nothing had been done uh, subsequently to process. Um. Now that is a matter which actually stems from a court ruling in 2014, where we have a gentleman who has um, over 200 head of livestock, and he's currently residing on about 28 hectares of land, waiting for the fulfillment of the complete order that the full extent of the land be agreed by the department and the landowner and allocated. We have now mapped that land, and uh, we really need to move on this matter. And he still is struggling to get interaction with the lawyer allocated by legal services, despite, sorry, legal aid, despite the fact that we have interacted with them in a group meeting, agreed on the maps produced by the National Geospatial Institute and so on. So that's just one example of the kinds of challenges and hence my recommendation that uh, we do take a portion of the budget. It's not new money and we, uh, together with the DG, we come up with a mechanism of managing that in order to have a proper legal team in place to accelerate processes of land claims resolution. On the matter in um, 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 Pumalanga, um, I did fully brief the DG. It has been answered. I'm aware of the forensic investigation. He's answered all my questions. So at the moment, uh, until such time as that is, is completed, I, I cannot really elaborate on it. It's in the Middleburg area and it involves um, the large uh, company known as Alzu. Um, okay, on the uh, issue of uh, delays in the approval of the SOPs, and that sort of is an essence of what is being discussed here. They're not relationship issues. I have excellent relationship with the DG, the DDG, and there are no problems that I would like to put before this um, before this committee in that regard whatsoever. The issue is the delays in the implementation of decisions. 
because we did submit those uh, SOPs uh, on the 31st of May last year, and now we're going for a year. We we really have lost time. It's unnecessary. I don't dispute the the process that has has been discussed here, but it should have been implemented from that time last year, and we shouldn't still be struggling now because even the extended time that is taken, I was told uh, that it would be complete a month ago. So I think really, you know, the, these are operational management issues and I haven't even intervened to try and speed it up um, directly, but I'm just saying that these are unnecessary and those are the things we need to resolve. I have com compiled a compliance register and far more time, if we look cumulatively in terms of when directions were given by the court and when they've been implemented by the department, it already doubles the time of my initial term. And I will reflect on that and emphasize in the court orders, it's clear that was an initial term requested by myself, not a decision of the court. It was a decision based on what I personally had had requested, but we'll come to that uh, in, in a moment uh, when, I, when I end my input. Um, certainly I am of the view that in a number of provinces, the number of claims that were um, that are recorded is is extremely low and dubious, and I, I can't really give the answers why. And I don't think necessarily going into the past and pointing fingers at service providers, et cetera, et cetera, is going to help us. What I know as a former accounting officer for sixteen years is if a so, uh, if a service is outsourced. As a DG, as an accounting officer, I can't blame anyone else if I did not take remedial action before paying for that service being delivered. So I, I really think that, you know, whatever happened, we are in a situation where a lot of claims have been lost. We cannot quantify them at this, at this moment. The only way to get to the bottom of it is on the ground or to make a facility available, which the lost claim strategy suggests at district level for people to come forward and make inquiries as to whether the claims which they believe they have lodged um, are being processed by the department. And then the process will be in place to determine the veracity of such allegations which are being made in order to really try and deal with people who genuinely have claims that were lost. Um, Okay, on the issue of capacity, I mean, I think I would just like to say what our, our former president in the second administration has, has said before, and better, fewer, but better. I think if we really try and focus on quality rather than quantity, but have people dedicated on labor tenants from where I sit, and it is my intention to continue working on the ground and to have a back office that will deal with the data system, uh, the project management system and so on, I think we will we will make much more progress than if we keep diluting people's responsibilities and giving them all these different tasks which they have to do in different uh, programs under tenure. That is my personal recommendation um, that, that, that I would make since the question has been posed to me. Um, <clears throat> on the issue of what will happen um, because already the term, the initial term will expire. I think the point to clarify is that the supervisory monitoring and oversight powers of the land claims court will be there until the final labor tenant claim has been resolved. Um, so that is a matter I am uh, recommending to the department we take up in the next court hearing. Um, and the outcome would, would uh, subsequently be conveyed. But I don't think that it's we must treat this thing as a five-year intervention because I was asked to name my conditions and I did have something else at the time which I, for, which I decided to forego in favor of taking on this particular assignment. Um, so this, this, this issue of the term is an initial term and it, it was linked to a specific request which I made as an initial term. I did not envisage the kind of challenges that I've been faced. Um, and by and large, I'm in full agreement with my colleagues from the department that these are not really relationship issues. They're issues around the nature of the work. 
Uh, obviously, on my side, I'm only focusing on one thing. And for me, it is a, it is the special master is an opportunity for the department to have a dedicated high level focus on this very, very critical project. And that's what we should keep in mind and commit jointly to really dealing with it. Uh, if you look at the, the court judgments right through the, the even including the dissenting judgments, it's clear that what, what the court has in mind, that the statutory functions by performed by the DG on this particular legal framework are taken by the special master. It doesn't mean the special master will be the actual person who signs, but the special master will work in collaboration with the DG. And that is the relationship as the DG has indicated that we have established together. So um, I do thank you for this opportunity. Um, I, would, I would avail myself. Hopefully we would really come with some good news if we will do things the way which I, which I am recommending. And that is that, uh, we really get those targets right. We understand what, what each and every farm target means, and we work through these initial MACRI projects together during the, the remainder of the financial year. I think we will deliver more than those targets when I look at the targets which are recorded there for Mpumalanga in particular. But it will definitely require that there are some dedicated officials. It is impossible for myself and my office manager to complete a project where we have 108 applicants on one farm to do each and every interview. We need the support of the department. Uh, at, at points, they're there with us, but as soon as we go, they disappear. They don't go back and finish. And that's really the kind of issues we need to deal with. And hence, what I've said, we are, we are currently in a training process. We do have commitment from both uh, Mpumalanga and Gauteng provinces. You can see Gauteng itself has quite a high level of or a high number of, of claims recorded. And when we walk out here, if we walk with the officials from the department, I, I really have confidence that we can increase uh, the delivery on this program. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair, uh, Honorable Min Minister and Deputy Ministers and, and colleagues from the department. Thank you. Thank you, honorable members. That was the presentation from the special, uh, the responses from the special master and uh, the officials of the department and the executive. And that uh, concludes honorable members, the engagements and the presentations on the special master. Uh, on, on the labor tenants claims that uh, we took presentations from both the department and the special master. We have as our last uh, item, honorable members, a presentation from the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development on Animal Protection Amendment Bill. We'll also have uh, the input from legal services after we uh, have taken this presentation. Honorable members, allow me to therefore welcome again the department to present the Animal Protections Amendment Bill. Um, good um, day uh, to you, Honorable Chair. Um, we have got a presentation that is going to be made by a team led by Ndate Dipepenenin uh, um from our animal production uh, unit within the department. Today, the presentation will be led by Dr. Mulefe, uh, who will take you through the presentation and the responses will be from the team that is here, the entire team from animal production and health and that uh, Desra himself. With your permission, Chair, can we call upon that the, um, uh, Dr. Mulefe to make the presentation? Dr. Mulefe, please go ahead.
1 bit. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, good morning to Honorable Members. Uh, this presentation is uh, in response to the um, draft uh, amend animals protection amendment bill that was that has been tabled before the PC committee and uh, the department is therefore reacting uh, or contributing making its submission on the bill itself um, the purpose of today's presentation is uh, to respond to the bill itself but also to respond to one or two issues that were raised at the previous meetings that were held in February on the 21st and on the 24th of February. And to just uh, go straight into the issues that were raised that form the basis of uh, the discussions that uh, will unfold today, we thought it wise that we go back to those questions uh, and then provide a response to those that we have identified as key questions in order to put a, a, a baseline that will afford members uh, um, a reasonable level of understanding in terms of uh, the, thereafter contributing to the bill itself. Um, at the meeting of the 21st of February, it was raised that um, South Africa has been scored a category E by the Animal Protection Index, uh, which is an index by the World Animal Protection Organization. And um, therefore, um, it was said that that is a very low score and South Africa should strive to be higher than that. But in our response to that is that, yes, we acknowledge that we are at a level E. However, this organization is a private organization and its standards are private standards and therefore we might not necessarily have an influence on how the standards are being set and therefore the outcome that comes out of that particular standard is a standard that we cannot then influence and um, generally as a country we utilize standards from recognized international standards generating bodies such as the oie or which is now called the woh OAH, World Organization of Animal Health. Now, what we found uh, difficult with the scoring of South Africa at a level E is that we found that there were inaccurate statements that were put by the organization in, in its assessment of a country. I may, I'll give one or two examples, which um, they talking about the Minister of Justice being the one that is responsible for for the bill itself. In as much as the bill is still talking, the act is still talking about the Minister of Justice, but we know that it has been proclaimed that, and and it's now under the the Minister of uh, Agriculture, Land Reform, and Rural Development, which is a minor thing, but you don't know how their methodology then affects their scoring on the basis of whether that. Uh, the act itself is in the right ministry according to their methodology or scoring scoring uh, 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 criteria but also the issue where they then talk about the absence of the definition of sentience means that the scope of the, the act itself is limited and we argue that the um, the definition yes it might not necessarily be there of animal sentience but when you look at the act itself the content of the act provides enough measures to protect animal welfare and therefore we find it um, unfair to score a country less because of a definition but not necessarily checking whether the content of the act itself then covers that you know um, area which is animal sentience of animal of animals and then you can also look at the issue of um where they are saying it is not clear it is not clear about this it is not clear about that it is not clear about that now we're thinking that is unfair to then write the country on statements that you are not clear about without writing to the country or contacting the country to get up-to-date information and thereafter then you are able to then score having received you know up-to-date information and we are confident that had they contacted us maybe their scoring might have uh, have been different uh, if you look at this uh, slide, um, 
that is on the screen. This is a slide that shows where South Africa is rated as compared to other countries around the world. Some countries are not rated and most of them are in um, Africa, but then we are at E and most of the countries around the world are at D. So you may argue that South Africa is not far off the mark as compared to most of the countries around the world. There are a few countries that are above AED, which are mainly in the European countries, and you see India there uh, at, a, at a score of C. So you, it can be argued that we are not doing that bad. And we don't know had we interacted with this association or organization you know, and provided information that would clarify those errors where they say it is not clear. Chances are we could have been at a different score. Now, the other thing that was mentioned uh, at one previous meeting was uh, where Honorable Briet would then uh, refer to an ideal being going the route of vegan cosmetics or cruelty-free cosmetics. We thought it wise to explain those terminology to honorable members so that if a decision is taken to go that route, it is clear as to what it means, what a vegan cosmetic is and what a cruelty-free cosmetic means. And um, the understanding of vegan cosmetic in terms of the labeling, it means the product does not contain animal products. However, this does not necessarily mean that they, they were not tested on animals. So that's a, a difference where, you know, some people may take vegan products as, as meaning that the animals were not utilizing the testing of that product, but that does not necessarily mean that. It just means that the product does not have any animal product. Uh, another term that is used is cruelty-free. Now, cruelty-free refers to an instance where for example, you have a product that has, let's say, five ingredients that make that product. Now, cruelty-free means, means the final product that you have at hand was not tested on animals. But it is possible that ingredients separately were tested on animals in the past. Uh, you know, you have some products that were tested more than even 30 years ago that are still utilized now. So a cruelty-free product could also include one or two of those products, uh, of those ingredients that were tested years ago, but the final product itself was not tested on animals. So it is uh, important that we clarify that, that if uh, honorable members were to then go for this route so that it is clear as to what these different terms mean. And the, the next slide is on uh, clarifying a, a statement that was issued that says that the department never uh, responded to the portfolio committee. In 2017, when this amendment was uh, first you know, introduced, and then in maybe this uh, current um, introduction of this uh, amendment. And our response is that the department was notified at that point in 2017 that it would be called to make a presentation to the committee. And at that, uh, at that point, no invitation was then uh, sent to the department and the department has always been ready. There were PowerPoint presentations that were made and packed, you know, waiting for the portfolio committee to uh, invite the department so that we could then present it. Therefore, um, it's not that the department refused or did not want to present to the committee at that point. The other area that needs to be clarified is when um, a, there was a statement that was issued by the legal advisor to the PC committee that uh, talked to the milk from South Africa not being able to be exported to the Netherlands because there's something that needs to be added to the milk and that we are not complying to that. And we thought it important that we correct the statement because this might also affect the trade uh, with, our, uh, with us and uh, other countries. There is no requirement for any substance to be added in milk. In, in fact, that would be adulteration of the milk itself. If we were to add anything to milk, if you were to add anything to milk, then you're changing what it means. Then it means something, some other product. But as pure milk, we cannot add anything to that milk. So we just needed to correct that. But then the issue with exportation of milk to various countries uh, that revolves around the requirements of 
the importing country, which could be on animal disease control, which could be on growth promoters or even on residue control programs. But also this issue of milk for Netherlands has nothing to do with animal welfare matter. And that's why we need to clarify that because this sitting is about animal welfare. And we are surprised that that issue of milk was then introduced under this uh, discussion. Um, honorable members, um, I would like to apologize because the next slide is a late edition that we introduced yesterday after having received this contribution from the Cosmetics, Toiletry and Fragrances Association, which you might not have in your package and we'll make that available immediately after this meeting. But we thought it important that we will then add that to the presentation to just show uh, the landscape of the cosmetic industry. And if you can uh, look at the slide, it would then uh, show that the cosmetic industry contributes to 0.1% of the GDP, and it employs about 60,000 uh, persons directly. But when you look at the second bullet, it then talks to the total size of the industry in South Africa, which is at about 25 billion you know, at retail value and uh, 19 billion of that at manufacturing level. But then also of importance is that when you look at now further down the value chain, the industry itself finishes about 150,000 stores. So that multiplies, you know, in terms of the livelihoods that depend on uh, the industry itself. And also um, it is over the last two years, the industry has experienced an estimated compound annual growth rate of 4.6% and is expected to grow, you know, going into the future. And the, the percentage of SMEs, which is um, companies that are, have a turnover of around uh, between 1 million and 50 million, in, uh, then contributes to 80%. And this is the information that CTFA would have provided to us. And in terms of composition of industry members, companies 35% uh, are manufacturers, 16% are importers, and 25% are exporters. And we are showing this information that we received from CTFA, which we understand um, its membership, it's about 85, 80 to 85% of the industry. So there's an organization whose uh, uh, figures, when we receive them, we take them seriously because we are confident that they are representing the industry. Um, now, well, uh, the first two statements are a repeat of what we have on the previous slide, which is what honorable members have in the document pack. Uh, but then we can then go into the third line where that says there's a currently there's currently no technology and expertise in South Africa in terms of alternative methods and therefore we are advising and warning that if we were to then have a total ban in terms of uh, the testing of cosmetics on uh, animals and you don't have an alternative you may find yourself in an instance in an instance where you have nothing that you can utilize because we have bent the only route that you had, but then you have you don't have alternatives. And as a result, you might not be competitive because other countries might have those alternatives, you know, uh, before they would then go for a total ban. And also in the absence of uh, technology and expertise, a ban will result in South African companies having to test co cosmetics outside of South Africa if that has to be done. And the cost of this might be much more, you know, for the South African companies as compared to their multinational uh, uh, competitors. The next slide, we are saying that uh, the amendment may not achieve its intended purpose if it does not cover imported products as well. Um, honorable members may remember that uh, Honorable Swart has said that at this point, the bill is limited to only the, the ban in South Africa, but not on the testing, but not necessarily on the sale of uh, imported products that would have been tested on animals. And um, our response to that is that that might disadvantage local companies when they cannot be allowed to test locally on animals, but then 
multinationals may test in other countries and then flood the South African market with those uh, products. So that would be maybe regarded as unfair competition and you know uh, trade balance in favor of multinational uh, companies. The Dalrat also has no evidence of international trade protocols being linked to the testing of cosmetics on animals, because this is what was raised at a previous meeting, where it was then said that uh, international trade is being affected because of a testing of cosmetics on animals. We are not aware of such, and we have searched, and there's no trade partner that has interacted with us that then requires a statement on the ban on uh, testing of cosmetics on animal in order to trade other products or animal products. So the testing is general. Uh, the, the international trade protocol on animal welfare has to do with general animal welfare aspects and is not necessarily related to cosmetics, you know, uh, and the testing of those products on animals. Now, going uh, doing a benchmark exercise as to how other countries are then uh, handling the ban or are handling the testing of cosmetics on animals. We looked at the European Union, and yes, it is true, you know, in agreement with what uh, Honorable Swal presented, that the EU has placed a ban on the marketing and testing on cosmetics on animals. However, it is important to make the statement that uh, they have made a provision in their law that member states can apply for a derogation to the ban under exceptional circumstances and in this case they have put one or two areas that where a member state may request you know an exemption from testing under you know circumstances such as the ingredient is in wide use and cannot be replaced by another ingredient and also where there is evidence of human health problems. So those are two of those areas where a member state can um, then request a derogation. And therefore, you will, when you look at it, yes, there's a ban, but then under exceptional circumstances, there may be a derogation and the EU may allow a member state to then be allowed to conduct limited testing. And this is an approach that uh, we are uh, following. Now, in terms of um, the alternative testing methods that are available on the market, these include in vitro testing, include human volunteers. Yes, there are um, humans that would be willing to, uh, to, for these products to be applied on their skins or on other parts of their body so that then, you know, researchers can then uh, make a finding and, you know, a decision be taken thereafter. But there's also computer modeling and also human tissues that are sourced from hospitals uh, after surgery. Like when uh, excess skin is being removed uh, during surgery, that skin may be then utilized, you know, for testing of cosmetics. And the final one is reduction in terms of the number of animals used in testing. It's not necessarily an alternative method to utilizing animals, but it then talks to reducing the ultimate number of animals that are going to be used in the testing. Now, we also looked at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is a membership that includes at least 15 EU countries. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, and the US are also part uh, thereof. And their statement on the testing of cosmetic products on animals is that the welfare of laboratory animals is important. It will contribute to, it will continue to be an important factor influencing the work in the OECD chemical products. And they are recognized that uh, some testing cannot be eliminated. I'm not going to read the whole statement verbatim, but uh, safe to say that they've also then indicated that such testing cannot be eliminated at present, but every effort should be made to discover develop and validate alternative testing system to use to testing of cosmetics uh, on animals. And they go on further to say a complete ban on the use of animals to test cosmetics leaves very few options available. And therefore, you know, they might still be room to consider utilizing animals under very limited circumstances. And they also then say the manufacturers of cosmetics 
should utilize whatever appropriate methods, including animal testing, that are available. But then they go on further to then um, recommend that guidelines on the use of animals must however be developed to ensure that as few as possible animals are used you know of this testing to get scientifically justifiable justifiable reasons finally an extract from uh, the oecd talks about um, if uh, before approval is given to use whole animals for testing of cosmetics there should be evidence that uh, consideration to other alternative methods have taken place. So when you look at their, um, uh, their recommendation, yes, they are advocating for a ban on the usage of animals um, you know, in testing cosmetics. However, they acknowledge that there may be some scope where there may be there may not be alternatives and therefore if that has to be done then some considerations have to be made in terms of regulating this that sphere um now honorable members going into the bill itself we looked at the definition of cosmetics and yes this is a definition and we acknowledge and we note that this definition is s is in the Foodstuff Cosmetics and Disinfectants Act. And our input is that in terms of the control of uh, cosmetics under the Foodstuffs Cosmetics and Disinfectants Act, this definition complies and it's broad enough to include all those uh, products that you can term as cosmetics so that that act is able to control those uh, products. However, if you take the same definition and you want to utilize it for the ban on the testing of cosmetics, now you'll find that then you have a problem that now this definition is too broad, which will then include products that we have uh, highlighted there, including products used in the external genital organs for cleansing, for correcting body odors, and for conditioning. And to us, we argue that those products may not be classified in the you know, baseline definition of cosmetics, which talks about generally beautifying of people. But for example, a toothpaste is regarded as a cosmetic under this um, uh, definition. And therefore, it, it, it then limits to then say that uh, there may not be a situation where you'd want to test those utilizing, you know, animals. And you you will then note that if you don't have alternatives, as we have said, uh, according to the situation in a country, then you're left with having no areas where you can then test for these products that we regard as personal care and well-being and not necessarily as cosmetics as you know a layman's definition would understand what a cosmetic is and therefore we are cautioning against including a broad definition if this is the way to go of um, cosmetics to include personal care and well-being products but when it talks to about beautifying products there's a different there's a different uh, story um, we have also looked at subsection one and a which talks to the testing of an animal of a, on an animal of an ingredient that may be included in a cosmetic shall not constitute an offense where the testing is for a purpose unrelated to the use of that ingredient in a cosmetic. And we are arguing that this may um, create a loophole in that it is possible uh, that uh, some companies may bypass this provision by applying and testing an ingredient as a medicine but knowing well that they want to extrapolate the results thereof in terms of how they will apply to the beauty industry or to cosmetics industry so, so therefore you know it is still possible that um, you know some companies may do research in terms of uh, you know in as a disguise of testing for a medicinal product, but ultimately they know that the intention is for cosmetic usage. Now, as a recommendation, and um, I would also then, um, you know, uh, follow what the minister has said, you know, at the opening of this meeting in terms of um, 
where we are pitching the recommendation in terms of um, the ministers the ministers provided in terms of the the recommendation of the department in terms of the bill being undesirable as it stands but then we are saying if there is no alternative in terms of you know you know the undesirability of the bill in total then we are then recommending you know a a, a different approach in terms of uh, this uh, bill and the approach that we are recommending honorable members is to go uh, what we call the three r principles now the three r principles it is talking about replace reduce refine now if we may then have to then uh, go into details as to what it means replace reduce and refine uh, you know the next slide then goes into details to clarify what that means whereby in terms of replacement that's a gold standard you want to replace the testing on animals completely but then this acknowledges that there may be instances where the replacement may not be possible and therefore the next then line would then be reduction where in terms of for example utilizing 100 animals then reduce lesser animals or actually use 10 animals use five animals or use one animal so there's a next line in terms of um, the the standard that you then want to approach and then finally if you cannot then reduce the numbers or even after having reduced the number of animals utilized then you still want to go further now the next advisor is then to refine the method that you are using and consider all alternatives that are available so that ultimately then you can work without without animal so this is a staged approach in stem in terms of the testing of uh, products on animals and therefore this is the approach that uh, in terms of the department we are recommending if the department if parliament had has to now go the route of um, implementing or amending you know the act itself now, if that has to go into the bill itself, we are then recommending in terms of the approach of replace, reduce, refine. To then amend as one option that is available, to then amend the bill or the, the act itself. Now, instead of then having a total ban, then you allow for limited testing, but for a company or a researcher to then go for that route, then they must apply to the minister for permission to conduct such testing. But then this, we don't leave it there. We make it so strict that, you know, only serious research can then be done. Now, there will be an independent panel of experts or, uh, in animal ethics that the minister will then appoint to look at every submission. And you know the applicant must provide reasons as to why alternative methods of testing are not desirable. So in a way, you are then going the route of reduction and refinement. You know, uh, if there are no you know um, alternative methods that we can use. So it's 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 in line with the three R approach that um, we we are recommending. But then the second option, not necessarily in terms of uh, importance whether the first option is more important than the second one. It's just a list of options that uh, we are providing is to, instead of maybe amending the Animals Protection Act, and we are of the opinion that the act itself, as it stands, provides the necessary assurances and measures to implement animal welfare in a country. And we know that uh, even the industry the animal industry, the animal welfare organizations are appreciative of the measures that are contained in the Animals Protection Act and have always said that the act is very strong and even other countries have acknowledged that in as much as it's an old act that you can refine in terms of you know the, the formatting but in terms of the content itself it provides the assurances but now you may also then go an extra route if you want to then regulate a particular area that may not be covered you know specifically in the act where the minister may make regulations and the minister has a, the power to make regulations on any reasonable requirements which may be necessary to prevent cruelty to or suffering of any animal and the minister may also make regulations uh, relating to generally such matters 
as are required for the better carrying out of the objects and uh, purpose of this act. So we are of the opinion that if there's a need to then regulate a particular area, such as cosmetics, then instead of changing the principal act itself, you may consider then making regulations that are specific for that area. And uh, an example is when you look at the animal welfare industry, there are a lot of areas where, you know, in terms of uh, going into that space and legislating that space, you do not necessarily have to then change the act. There's areas that you, honorable members may, may know, there's um, areas about lions in captivity, there's other areas that are um, being discussed even with the Department of uh, Forestry, Fisheries and Environment. There are very er many area, areas that have been discussed. Now you don't want to then make change the act for every situation that is that is there, like caged beds, there's also issues with caged beds. Now you, you know, but then the act itself as it stands, then if there is a need to make regulations for cosmetics or for caged beds or for uh, lions in captivity, you can then make those reg regulations under the existing act. And finally, honorable members, we are also of the opinion that when you look at the amendments, at the bill itself, we are of the opinion that then that straddles into the territory of other legislations and as uh, honorable minister i said at the beginning and we are of the opinion that the regulation of cosmetics is primarily a mandate of the department of health under the foodstuffs cosmetics and disinfectants act and therefore, we have the opinion that if there's any regulation that has to be done primarily on cosmetics, then that can be done under the Department of Health, under the FCDA. And um, we're also not sure ab about the level of uh, interaction that um, uh, the PC and Honorable Member Swart engaged with the Department of um, Health. But in terms of preparing our presentation we then engaged with the department of health to get their view on this matter and the department of health is of the same opinion as we are in terms of our approach to this particular um piece of legislation um i this then brings us to the end of a presentation thank you very much honorable chairperson and members Thank you, honorable members. That has been uh, the presentation from the Department of Agricultural and Reform and Rural Development on the Animal Protections Amendment Bill. As indicated, honorable members, in the correspondence to the department, this was an opportunity for the department to make clear policy inputs on the subject of the Animal Protections Amendment Bill. The, commit, the committee is of the opinion that this was not sufficiently addressed in the last meeting and the engagements we had. And they required, therefore requested for the meeting uh, to uh, be held again, but with the meet, in with Honorable Swart that was agreed to in the last engagement, which was not necessary as the bill is now before the committee. Therefore, any inputs that were made by the department would have liked to discuss with the member have been raised today as such input is important to guide the committee as it will be deciding on the desirability of the legislation. It should also be noted, honorable members, that there will be no further presentations from the department on the matter after today. And to prevent any further delays, the committee has to make a determination on how they proceed with the legislation and therefore let me take the opportunity to open the session for questions of clarity so that we can satisfy ourselves 
before inviting legal services, uh, Umar Mush Amin van der Merwe to uh, assist the committee in terms of what would be the way forward. Honorable members, any further questions of clarity on the matter? Honorable Kape, can we remove the presentation of the screen? Honorable Kape. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I don't have um, questions. I have comments and the take based on uh, what uh, the department has just presented. And I don't know if it will be proper that we do it now or we listen to the legal. But if you allow, I will say what I want to say and the legal will come at the end. You can proceed on that, Robert Klapper. Thank you, Chair. Chair, let me appreciate the response to issues that uh, this committee raised when we were interacting with this uh, bill for the first time. Notably, Chair, as uh, we have heard, is that uh, the bill has narrowed its focus to testing of cosmetics. And the presentation before us indicates that this, in a way, it's a part of the Department of Health. It straddles to the Department of Health. There's also an indication that the other stakeholders that is impacted upon here, it's your trade, industry, and competition department. And uh, it says to me, Chair, as this department here, Dalrat, that we are overseeing, they don't have absolute mandate over this bill because when you touch it, it touches other departments. My main question, Chair, last time was, is there no legislation that covers the protection of animals? I went and read, Chair, tried to look into whose responsibility is that this, despite this department, I found the National Council on SPCAs that sits on ethics committee on animals, precisely to make sure that animals that are used on research are not abused. That is the point, the other point. Now, Chair, the presenter is saying to us, if you come with a ban of this uh, testing also on animals, you harming businesses in South Africa that are contributing to what we have seen, those to the GDP. And my take is that chairs where I'm sitting, we cannot afford to do that, even if this was within our ambit as a department. Chair, the slide, first slide indicates the standards on which we the bill being presented was based on. And uh, besides it being from an organization that is not an international organization, probably a bit misleading for me, would be the E that comes on that slide of maps to say where South Africa stands. South Africa for me is a developing country and I would want to agree that uh, as a developing country, where we are is not a train smash. It means when you look at that orange all over, the greens are very small pieces there. And as a developing country, I don't think we could be uh, put under the bus with that. Uh, 
And I would also chair look at uh, the consideration slide 10. No alternative, or if we they saying there are alternatives on testing, it's human, it's computer modeling, it's in everything. I then ask myself, what is the problem? How big the problem is in animal testing in South Africa? And I couldn't find answers. And uh, looking at the considerations also, I thought about the current situation where businesses or SMMEs buy cosmetics in China and come and package. And it talks to what the presentation is saying. But even if you can ban here, you will not be able to control the imports that tantamount to what they called unfair competition, disadvantaging the locals, which then if you touch on this bill, it defeats the purpose of why we would even want to say we could go that route. Benchmarking with, the, uh, with European Union. In, in fact, theirs is not a total ban that they're advocating because there's derogation. Now, as a developing country, coming up with all these agro-processing master plans and everything, do we think we can even go to the standard that EU is, is, has put? But the very same EU has got advisories to say what should happen in case animals has to be used. Hence, I'm saying it's not a, a total ban. And probably it's where the scale of animal testing in cosmetics that are under health is huge. Here in a developing country, I'm unable to put my finger on the pulse as to how big the problem is. I would therefore chair, based on what I've said, coming to the desirability, saying as a developing country chair, Looking at the standards that has been set for we are at E, I don't think our program is huge. Our problem on this one is huge. Based on the indication that this legislation that is protecting the use of animals, we have in National Council of SPCA that is sitting on ethics committees of animals precisely to watch over uh, abuse during research. Based on the fact that this is, we don't have an absolute mandate on this one. It's more stakeholders that are involved. And those advisories on slide 13, 14, 15 or 16 there, I would not even want us to venture into the recommendations because recommendations are there on OECD advisories. I would say, Chair, where we are, now I'm satisfied and we should work with what we have. This thing, a piecemeal approach that each time we will want to amend here and there, tomorrow we will have this uh, organization that are saying we must not slaughter culturally in our townships or in the estates against our culture. We'll come here and say, I meant something else. So I, I don't think uh, we having such a huge problem that would warrant us to venture into what we were saying. So according to me, Chair, we are fine where we are and let's pro process what we're having as and when we're having challenges. In fact, for me, I would have argued for a total overall piece of legislation that will include everything, all these stakeholders that are attached. But for us to want to narrowly focus on this now, it doesn't uh, say it's desirable. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Klappe. Honorable Tatema Sipa. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, Demodi, uh, thank you very much for clarity around this bill. Uh, I have got some few questions, but I think uh, Metlape covered one, one of them. Um, 
you indicate in your presentation, sir, that uh, 2017 you waited to present uh, to the portfolio committee in terms of the uh, work that you have done around the bill. And uh, also that uh, the e-score, which is being used um, uh, or is going to be used has not been adopted by the World Animal uh, Health uh, OIE. So I think the question for me is that um, since obviously this is, uh, those codes have been developed, um, you often meet with OIE, I will assume. The question is, uh, when you met, when did you meet the last time? And has this matter not been raised with them in terms of how they have uh, eventually categorized South Africa as belonging into the E category? That's the first one. There is um, a point you have raised here or a point that was raised when this bill was referred to yourself with regards to the vaccination, the process of vaccinating animals against hot water is cruel. And you gave quite a, a, a response there. I might have missed in the bill, is that um, something that the hot water vaccination is covered in this particular bill? I just want to really understand how the hard water vaccination now gets in here because I mean, we do those uh, hard water, uh, I mean, we encounter those hard water challenges, too, especially with sheep. The, the one point that is very important that Metlabe addressed is the issue of export and import of animal and animal products. At the moment, we have got our challenge with animal disease as you have highlighted. Uh, that we are not able, obviously, to export. Uh, but the question of uh, this, um, what you call the um, uh, the uh, cosmetics, are, are we also limited or uh, banned from exporting this um, uh, cosmetic products? And uh, obviously, if this uh, market is for chair, uh, or cosmetic is for local um, uh, production and consumption. I will also agree with Metlabe that uh, we, sit, we might just sit with a big problem around the issue of uh, flooded with exports that are not compliant, obviously, to our regulations and uh, which might not occur well for ourselves as a, uh, um, a country, you know, to find that we consume everything that is produced elsewhere while you know, locally we are not able to produce. Um, Chair, that's really my contribution to this. I am not really strong around this particular bill in terms of really for or against, as minister has asked us to make a deliberation and make a move. I will, if we have to make a, our position, I'll have to consult quite extensively around this bill uh, in terms of our position, whether we are for or against. But thanks, Chair, for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Masipa. Honorable Trader. Honorable Trader. Thank you. Um, Sorry, Chair, we're struggling to hear Honorable Tread. Honorable Tread, you are not audible. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me now? Yeah, much better, but can you speak to the mic? All right, thank you, Chair. Um, I hope I'm audible enough now. Yeah, um, proceed. No, oh, thank you. Sorry for that. I will be very good. I'm traveling to London this week, so I don't have a lot of uh, everything that I want to say, but I will be very good. Uh, the bill has been tabled before us um, a few times, as you have already indicated in your own your that um, 
Since we are sitting at the table, and this is the last time that we might be here for this It is very much clear the, 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 the issues uh, that we needed clarity on the day before, the department came back and clarified them. Now, Chair, the bill has been taken, um, a, a proposed amendment to us that we need to amend, but mainly it focuses on the community pattern. Now, which may Chair, in my view, I firmly believe this bill as it is, it is sufficient to cover all the aspects that uh, the honorable member proposing that it should be amended. So I don't see any need to further amend the bill. It protects the animals, and we cannot amend the bill only based on the issue. It, 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 it focuses on the cosmetic part of it. There's a lot that is okay here. That if you amend the bill based on the cosmetic part of it, of, on, of the, of, on, on the cosmetic component, you might run a risk of overlooking or compromising other issues that are, other aspects that are also uh, included in the bill. That is my contribution, Chair. I propose that we leave the bill as it is. And it talks to everything and what we will do because the aspect of the energy number is going to amend. Thank you, Honorable Trader. We are picking up other noises in the transportation mode that you are in. So we'll move on to uh, other honorable members. Uh, honorable Dr. Uh, Matthias. Honorable Matthias. I'm not seeing him on the platform, Chair. Thank you, Akbar Briet. The Honorable Mbabama. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, without repeating what um, some of my colleagues have said, I just have one or two questions. Um, the department in its presentation reports that there is currently no technology and expertise in South Africa for alternative methods of testing of cosmetics. Um, does this mean that testing of cosmetics on animals is a common practice in the country? And could you could uh, the presenter please provide details? Over and above that, Chair, I would um, uh, 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 like them just to talk to other alternative methods, even if they are not in the country. What other alternative methods are there? And then in the absence of alternative methods in this country, as they say, does this mean that testing of cosmetic products on animals should be allowed, irrespective of the manner in which such testing is done or impacts the welfare of the animals? That is all from me, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Mbabama. The Honorable Tapa. Tell you, Chair. Uh, let me first uh, appreciate the presentation. And without repeating what my colleagues have said, we always remember that in the process of these discussions, we had always wanted to know whether there is no legislation that can cover what we are grappling with. And also in that same discussion, there was a situation where there was an indication that the reason for coming with the bill is because the department will still take too long to come to the conclusion of any legislation that will cover this purpose. Uh, but now I'm happy that the department is able to come today with this input, which I believe it is making us wiser and making us uh, move possibly to the direction that maybe is necessary for our country. Here, we are all in, in the interest of 
our people in the interest of our animals as well. Uh, and it's at the same time, we do not want to stifle the, any process of research, which has always been the interest of this department and this society. And therefore, to me, this presentation from the department makes it clear that it is possible that the, our fear or the fear that exists is covered within the existing legislations or can be covered within the existing legislations. And therefore, if one has to be brief, the conclusion is that knowing that at the same time, we don't have any, any disaster. And also you remember that there was some indication that this proposed bill, the proposed bill is mainly preempting any further situation that there is no experience that is really uh, threatening that, that situation. But now with the input by the department, to me, as I insist that it's making us wiser, and it's, uh, it's showing us that, that within the current situation, the existing situation, we are covered. And therefore, it comes to me that maybe I should not be afraid to say, uh, I do feel that there is no desirability of this piece of legislation at this moment, given that Anything that we, are, we can be feared, it is possibly going to be covered. I thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Tapa. Uh, the Akbar Briat. Thank you, Chairperson. You will please excuse me for also not putting on my camera. I am just um, in a difficult position. Um, Chairperson, let me maybe start off um, where Ntate Klaba left, uh, left off or left it and just say I do believe there is motion of desirability for this bill and I think it needs to be. Um, we, need, we as a committee need to consider it and I would like to refer colleagues to the first interaction session we had with the Honorable Swart regarding, um, regarding this bill. And um, in his introduction, he said that this bill is a preemptive bill um, to ensure that animal uh, testing on animals does not happen in future. Um, and, and I would like to, to put it there and then chairperson, um, and therefore I think it is necessary. I don't think we can just as a committee always be reactive, reactive, reactive. I think we need to start being proactive as a committee. And I see this legislation as part of being proactive towards legislation, proactive towards the, the welfare of our animals. And um, therefore, I think there's, there is desirability. In terms of, of what the department said, Chairperson, um, I think in terms of the scoring I have to speak out and say I have an extreme frustration with the department and with this presentation because it does not differ um, extremely from the first presentation and I to this day believe that the department misunderstands this bill. They are not seeing this as the narrow bill that it is um, and that they are purposefully misunderstanding it. Um, and then I would like to would like to add to that 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 we should be we should we should be careful of not misleading this this um, this committee um, in terms of what is being said regarding animal testing. And I think it is important to make the stance that currently there are no laboratories in South Africa testing on animals. There is no cosmetics currently being sold in South Africa that is being tested on animals. So the fact that we are talking about the um, the, the um, implication that it will have on jobs, the fact that we are talking about um, the relevance of it to, um, to an import export market, it's not having an impact on the export or import market whatsoever. It's just for um, use within South Africa and that is not being impacted because there's no use. There is also no laboratories testing cosmetic ingredients in South Africa, no laboratories doing that. So that stance from the, from the, um, from uh, uh, the department, I think is incorrect in that saying. 
um, when we speak about the, where, where they said the process of vaccinating animals against hard water is cruel, hard water and the vaccinations have nothing to do with this bill. This bill has to do with cosmetics and the testing of cosmetics on animals um, and, and the fact thereof. And I think we need to get to that point. I need to also think and reiterate, Chairperson, that we need to look at what our international counterparts is doing. And in March of 2013, the European Union announced a full ban on both the sale and import of cosmetics that are tested on animals and contain ingredients tested on animals. So in fact, if we would were, we were to accept this bill and take it forward, it would actually enhance and and be positive towards our exports because then we would already have the necessary certification to actually export to the EU. So even though it does not directly affect that, indirectly it will benefit us. Um, the third country to ban the sale, marketing and import of all cosmetics, detergents and toiletries that have been tested on animals. This law was developed in 2010 already, but took effect in 2013. I think that's important to take note of. South Korea chairperson has started a five-year plan for animal welfare, including the implementing of a ban on animal testing of cosmetic of the cosmetics industry and even marketing any of such products. The United States and Canada have also both announced that they are starting programs and introducing legislation that forbid animal testing for products made in the country and the sale of imported products. So I think this bull chairperson um, really speaks to really speaks to what we need. Um, I think in terms of of the recommendations, and I think Honorable Slape said that, is we cannot decide that now. I don't think we're in that stage, however. But Chairperson, I really want to do I really want to implore on this committee that we need to be proactive. We need to think about um, the long run for South Africa and we really need to consider this bill. And Chairperson, I would maybe leave it at that. Um, I think you can hear my passion for this bill. I think you can hear my passion for for animals, for animal welfare, and the fact that we need to be preemptive. Thank you. Thank you, Akbar Breed. Uh, the Honorable, Honorable Marshal. The Honorable Memasho. The Honorable Dr. Montuedi. Dr. Montuedi. Any other Honorable member on the platform I've not recognized? Honorable Swart. Um, Chair, I need your guidance here because I'm not sure to what degree you would allow me to rebut issues at all, whether that is procedural or not. But I, I did want to just remind members that this is such a narrow bill and it is proactive and there is no testing on animals in South Africa. And Chair, I would just like to respectfully remind you of what you said at the outset, Ha important the drive is to criminalize and prohibit the testing of cosmetic products on animals. And this was underpinned by Ntata President Nelson Mandela, who said there can be no keener revelation of a society sold in the way in which it treats its most vulnerable. And that this was considered a progressive piece of legislation, a positive contribution, given the fact that almost 100 million animals are used in research worldwide, you made these very, very important points at the beginning. And that at this stage, there is no legislation. There's no planned legislation. And so I, I don't want to engage with the department. I really appreciate Dr. Malefe. I appreciate the work that they've done. I appreciate the minister. But I think there's a lot of elements that are missing here. When you look at how narrow this bill is and the positive benefits that it can bring in our stance when it comes to cosmetic testing, on animals worldwide and the move, not only from developed countries, but from particularly developing countries as well. And I think, Chair, there, there is, um, as you pointed out, and as my firm belief is that this is a win-win bill for all of us, 
it is so narrow and that it is proactive look into the future chairperson it is following other countries that are also like new zealand that are proactive in this way there are no laboratories for testing and it is so narrow and i've even allowed exemptions in the narrowness which the department picked up so chair i can only implore you because bearing in mind there are 45 odd welfare organizations and the department says that they're happy with the bill well they're not happy with this aspect that's why there are 45 organizations that are pleading for this change there are thousands of people and chair there may i just also add that there are 7,000 registered ingredients already worldwide that can be used it impacts it will be impacting going forward what one is allowed to import and what one is allowed to export but at this stage the departments of health and trade and industry made no comments despite the fact that the bill narrow bill was gazetted in 2020 already so i would urge the committee just to consider referring this for comments so that we could then uh, satisfy all those organizations that have been waiting for six years for some move on looking at the cosmetic um, testing of animals. I welcome the department's possible alternatives, and I really would like to engage further on this issue, given the fact that it's not me speaking. This is these are organizations that have approached us as parliament to look into this issue. So I can only plead with you, Chair, that let us have some time to consider this. The minister correctly said, let us reflect on this bill. I appreciate the department's stance, but I do think that there is, that we're missing the narrowness of this bill, the narrowness, and I'm missing the inputs from the other departments, despite the fact that it was gazetted. So Chair, I don't, I can't take it further. My colleagues have um, argued um, about the desirability, but I think maybe it is slightly premature to decide on that now. Could we not Look again at the memorandum of the bill where I point out all the countries in the world that have moved out, that have moved into this situation, um, my presentation, and then align it with what the department has said. A lot of what they said is in support of looking at um, certain legislative amendments. And if at the end of the day, it should be through a regulatory process, let us look at that. Let us engage with the other departments, but let us not. Um, disappoint all those organizations, those thousands of people that have made submissions at this early stage of the consideration. So Chair, I appreciate you giving me a last moment just to make a, a passion plea in this regard. And I would leave it to the wisdom of the committee members to as they deliberate on this issue. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, honorable members. Any other honorable member on the platform who I have not recognized? Thank you, honorable members. If not, uh, I will also raise a few questions of my own, as I am not sure why is the department mentioning a 2017 bill by the honorable Dudley, a bill that we as the Sixth Parliament Committee have not seen as it loves at the end of the fifth parliament. What we are interested in, honorable members, is the current animal protections amendment bill by honorable Swart, which was also published in the government gazette. And we are providing you an opportunity to raise policy issues specifically on the honorable Swart's bill. The honorable minister, and the Department of Agricultural and Reform and Rural Development in their presentation mentioned other issues that they feel the current amendment bill does not address. Yet you are not telling us as to how you are addressing or even planning to address those shortcomings. Please note honorable members that this is a private members bill and the member has explicitly explained in his presentation and even in his input right now that this bill is narrowly and specifically focused on the testing of cosmetic products and their ingredients on animals and protection of animal 
is the responsibility of the Department of Agriculture and Reform and Rural Development. Honorable members, the minister also mentioned the impact the bill may have on the legislation. Unfortunately, the presentation does not provide specific details on such legislation and how they will be impacted. Can the department provide specific detail on such legislation and how it will be impacted by the private members bill? Honorable members, let me remind you that through the legacy report of the fifth parliament, we know that the department brought to parliament an amendment to another old piece of legislation, the Performing Animals Protections Amendment, a bill known as PAPA. During the proceedings of PAPA bill, similar issues to the ones that the department is now raising on this private member's bill, including more animal welfare matters were raised. At the time, which was in 2015, the department proposed uh, and promised parliament the development of a comprehensive animal welfare bill to address all animal welfare matters. Without the comprehensive animal welfare bill that the department promised in fifth parliament, and until such time that the department brings the comprehensive bill to address shortcomings in existing legislation, there will always be a need for amendments to old and outdated legislation. In your denial of the scoring by the Animal Protections NGO, which is not necessarily important for the purpose of today's briefing, you yourselves mentioned that the organization referenced the Minister of Justice instead of the Minister of Agriculture, which of course was possible when you have an ancient legislation with numerous amendments. Can we get an update on the development of the animal welfare bill that was promised eight years ago? Finally, honorable members, honorable Swart has emphasized during his presentation, the legislation we are talking about does not extend to testing for medicinal and pharmaceutical purposes under which vaccines and other medicines fall under the bill, which is specifically on testing of cosmetic products regarding the advisory that the department presented from OECD, which does not, which does the department has the guidelines for the country specifically on testing of cosmetic products on animals to ensure their welfare. If not, should tomorrow or in a month's time, the SPCA or any other legitimate welfare organization found in humane cases of the use of animal on testing specifically for cosmetic products, what legislative instruments exist to address such cases. That would be all on my side, honorable members. I will now hand over to the department for their responses. Thank you. Thank you very much, honorable chair. I'll hand over to um, Dr. Molefe and uh, Mr. Saraka for the responses. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, uh, Honorable Chairperson. I see the minister is on the screen. I don't know if the minister wants to respond or should I continue? You can continue. I will come at the end. Thanks very much, uh, Minister, and uh, thanks, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, I'll go through the questions that were raised, and uh, one being um, Refer reference to the 2017 uh, bill and why we are talking about that. And as I said, when we started with the presentation, the first part was to respond to the questions that were raised previously. So this is not necessarily to do with the bill itself, but uh, that is one of the mandate 
that we were given by the portfolio committee to say, here's a list of questions that were raised, especially on the 21st of February, react to them. And these are the responses that we are putting. And yes, we agree that some of these questions may not necessarily be related to the cosmetics and the testing of cosmetics on animals, but because they were raised at that point, so we thought that we then needed to respond to them. Even uh, the issue of the, the vaccination of animals um, against hard water and the cruelty thereof, that was a question that was raised by one honorable member. And um, uh, we needed to respond to that because we have the opinion that parliamentary sittings are public uh, platforms. And if we don't correct a particular statement uh, so what will go out in a public would be a, a a statement that has not been corrected and that's why we needed to then respond to those questions including the 2017 reason as to why the department did not present so we needed to put it on record that it's not that the department did not want to respond it's just that the department was waiting to be called and so we need that to be going on record the same thing with the hard water vaccination um, now, in terms of what Honorable Masipa uh, talked about, about the OIE standards versus the World um, Organization, Animal Protection Organization, the OIE has standards, the OWA, you know, as we currently know it, has standards on animal welfare. There's a code that you call Terrestrial Animal Health Code. And there is chapter seven of that code it talks about animal standards that uh, countries have to comply with. And that's a standard that we are using, not necessarily the API index. And therefore, uh, you know, the, the OIE has its own set of criteria that they use, and they do not necessarily reflect on whether a country was a rated E or even up to G, but it's just the standards that they set. So they don't necessarily reflect on what other organizations are saying, unless those organizations then make a submission to the OIE in terms of generating set of standards that that organization would want the OIE to set as standards. And the OIE is open to, you know, uh, international bodies to sit at their meetings and make proposals in terms of generating standards. So this is how the OIE functions. Um, I'll skip the hard water vaccination from, uh, from Honorable Masipa because I've just talked about it. And um, now in terms of whether imports are, are compliant, yes, imports are compliant in terms of what we currently have. Now, which is not necessarily talking about testing of cosmetics on animals, but in terms of uh, whether there have been violations in terms of the current Animals Protection Act, if we were to be made aware that for this product, to then be put you know on the table these were particular violations that were you know incurred then the current act in terms of section two would make it a tool that we can utilize to then uh, even you know uh, take that um, product you know off or even go to court in terms of you know uh, uh, litigating against that particular area so yes uh, we we are confident that the current legislation in terms of animal rights and welfare you know includes almost all you know circumstances that you can think about in terms of cruelty, including if a product was to be brought in here and there's enough evidence that there were violations. We are, you know, of, of the opinion that the, the, the act would be a section two of the act. If honorable members can then look into that, it has a lot of provisions that, you know, instances of, um, of abuse of animals and, you know, uh, this testing would then be able to fall in under one of those. Um, now, in terms of whether, uh, from Honorable Mbabama, in terms of whether the testing is common in South Africa, and as has been responded to by Honorable Breed and Honorable Swart, yes, it is a preemptive bill, and there's currently no laboratories or no testing happening in the country. Yes, we acknowledge that. But at the same time, we are also saying if there is a need to then do that particular testing, we are also then saying this would be the impact 
if there would then be testing in future and we have banned that testing this would be the repercussions for the industry itself and for you know the populace and even the animals so we are also then providing preemptive you know responses in terms of you know the bill that we have in front of us so we are not necessarily saying you know this currently testing and therefore we are you know we are talking as if you know there is testing yes we acknowledge that there's no current testing but we are saying if there may be a need in the future for testing and we have removed that tool this will be the repercussions to the industry to the animals and to the to the nation and uh, uh, unfortunately i couldn't uh, clearly hear honorable Chwete, so but i i picked up that it was more of comments than a question but uh, you know other you know senior managers can help me if i missed anything uh, and also honorable Tap, i think you know what i had were comments and more than uh, questions now coming to honorable briet um we are of the opinion that we are clear in terms of what the bill serves to address and we are of the opinion that what we have provided today uh, is on a basis of us understanding the bill uh, it, the, there is, uh, we are confident that there is not necessarily a purposeful misunderstanding of a bill. We are just reacting to what could happen if the bill is put in place, the desirability and the undesirability of, you know, different provisions that have been proposed. And um, now in terms of, yes, we agree with Honorable uh, Briet that the EU has as, as, as uh, imposed a ban on a testing. However, uh, yes, we are also aware that, the, you know, as we presented, that there is derogation, that is, there is a poor, uh, provision for derogation that the EU itself has placed in as much as that may not have been tested, but it's there in the legislation in case it needs to be, you know, utilized in future, which might not even be necessary, you know, but then if you, do not make provision for something in legislation and then you get a circumstances that might need that and noting how long it takes to change legislation you now might be in a situation where you don't have a tool to address such a particular matter and therefore in as much as we are proactive in terms of uh, the draft for a ban but then you have to balance that with what happens if you have that ban and there's a need. And that's why we are saying, you know, if there could be provision that is made for exceptional circumstances, and in this case, a minister having the power to then allow or not allowing the testing after having been advised by an, a, a panel of experts. And that panel of experts will be uh, experts in terms of uh, different aspects, including animal welfare, including physiologies and all those things that would then look into that. And we are confident that if you were then to place that in front of such an animal ethics committee, they would then do a good job in terms of advising the minister in terms of, you know, whether there are alternatives, whether those alternatives can be utilized. And we are confident that such a panel would then say if there is alternatives that are available on the market and testing methodologies they would then say you know prove to us why you cannot use method a because we think in method a does not use animals and you will achieve you know the intended you know outcomes that you want so that is our approach in terms of that uh, and i think the contributions uh, by honorable swart you know um talk similar in terms of uh, what honorable Briet has talked about in terms of no current testing and laboratories um available and um, um also i think it was more in general um um comments um and and and, and likewise we also want to emphasize the fact that um, we understand the, nor the narrowness of the bill and we are also you know thinking that in as much as you a bill might be to amend one sentence but that sentence might have a repercussion on other legislation so it's not necessarily our our thing is that it's not necessarily on the narrowness but on the impact of that you know amendment uh, honorable mandela has raised uh, several issues including the 27 
Bill, why we are raising this. And as I've responded to that, that it's based on the questions that were raised. It's not necessarily to say that we those comments were not under responding to the current bill itself. It was just to put the record straight. And um, in terms of how the department is planning to address the shortcomings that may be there. And as we have recommended, uh, honorable uh, members, is that there is provision under the Animals Protection Act as it sits. There is provision under Section 10 to create regulations. And it's relatively easier to create regulations when you need them than to create an act or amend an act. And the minister would then have uh, the powers to create a regulation. And therefore, if there's a need to then regulate the cosmetics industry in terms of a testing of, on animals, if that has to be a need, and they, even if it's an urgent need, the minister can then you know, make regulations that would then be able to control that, 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 that area. And the impact on other legislation, as we said um, in the presentation, in as much as we did not write it there, but then one of the legislation, key legislations that we that is going to be impacted by this, and also that is also included when you look at the bill itself, is the Foodstuffs, Cosmetics and Disinfectants Act. And what we are saying is that if you were then to make an amendment under the Animals Protection Act on a matter that will then affect Foodstuff Cosmetics and Disinfectants Act, they need to also be brought onto the table to have a coherent approach in terms of how you are going to do it. Because you might approve it on, a, on one side in agriculture, but they are of a different opinion on their side. And then you may end up with conflict of legislations at some particular point. So we are advising that if this is the approach in terms of making this particular amendment, therefore all the relevant departments and the legislations that are applicable here, they must be brought into the same room and then we iron out all those things and check whether it's desirable for all the legislation, key of which is the foodstuff for stuffs, cosmetics, and disinfectants act, but also trade and industry have their own um, legislation that may affect trade, and you know that may also have a, a role to play. Now, in terms of the Papa, actually the animal welfare bill that uh, Honourable uh, Mandela has talked about, in terms of the promise that um, was made during the the amendment of Papa. Yes, that promise was made, and uh, as we have been reporting, you know, at various portfolio committee meetings, including the portfolio committee on environment, uh, uh, on forestry, fisheries, and the environment, we have been reporting that we are in a process of uh, developing that legislation. And yes, it has taken some time to develop that legislation, but um, there's a lot of areas that we have to then look into in terms of that development. And um, as it is now, that, that legislation is still being developed and we are also discussing it with uh, specific um, you know, uh, institutions um, to actually take it over in terms of now doing the scientific uh, background uh, work in terms of doing the relevant research that has to go in terms of advising the department uh, before the department can then introduce that bill you know, to parliament. So there is work that is uh, currently being done uh, on the animal welfare bill. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. I hope that has responded to the questions that were raised. Thanks. Honorable Minister, any closing remarks? Thank you, um, Chair. And, uh, oh, thank you, Chairperson, for the responses and questions and comments that we have received. And as indicated, I just want to clarify that I don't think the department is misleading the committee or rather is deliberately not wanting to understand the narrowness and the import of the bill. We do, but that is why we were saying 
from where we are, we do not think that the relevant legislations are not adequate enough to address the concerns. But also as an preemptive legislation, as Honorable Brad is saying, including Honorable Swar, it's even more important to have broader consultations with other arms of government that will be impacted upon. I understand Honorable Swar says that the bill was made public, the departments of health and DTIC has not come to the party. I appreciate that, but it still remains true that if we want to have even this minimal amendment, its impact is not just going to be on the animals, but it's also going to be on those other um, functions of the two departments which must be uh, considered for. And our view is that we, we can't be narrow in the way in which we approach this legislation and only look at it on one element, but look at it broadly. And we also need to look at other factors in terms of the capability of alternative testing, but also their ethics too. Because if you look even in what the department said, some of the alternative testing actually means you'll have to use humans as volunteers for testing of even these cosmetics, not just vaccine alone. So, I mean, the in vitro one, it's about using human tissue uh, and therefore you need human volunteers to do so. So I agree with the colleagues that are saying, we will need to think deeper and reflect even if this legislation is aimed to be preemptive to ask ourselves what will be its impact for the country. Thank you very much, Shepard. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Honorable members, allow me to uh, thank the department uh, on their presentation and responses on the Animals Protections Amendment Bill. And I want to put it to honorable members that uh, we don't have to uh, decide on the motion of desirability today. Today was just to get the policy issues from the department. And therefore, this is why I also invited uh, uh, Mamusha Main Fandemeva from legal services just to give us a way forward in terms of what uh, is the procedure uh, going forward uh, with uh, this uh, uh, bill. Allow me to therefore just uh, invite uh, Mama Oshamain uh, to give us uh, insight on what uh, is the procedure going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson, and good morning to you, to the members and to, to the department. Chairperson, the, the process is set out in the Assembly Rule 286. So that is what we must what we must look at. And I think after today's briefing, a number of things have become clear. Um, it is quite important that um, the, the committee gives the Department on Health an opportunity to also comment on the bill because they are not directly affected in the schedule to this bill. <clears throat> Apologies. But from the, what the department have, say, have said, it might be also important to give the Department of Trade and Industry an opportunity to comment on this bill. That I get from um, uh, Rule 286. <clears throat> Apologies, I now have a fro frog in my throat. Uh, uh, Subrule 4 um, E, which reads, um, if the bill was introduced by a member in his or her individual capacity, give the relevant department in the national executive authority or executive organ of state in the national sphere of government sufficient opportunity to make submissions to the committee on the objects and particulars of the bill. Um, initially, I, I was of the view that it would be sufficient just to have the department in order to, to discuss the desirability of the bill, uh, the, the topic of the bill. Um, but it seems to me that, that there is an indication um, there's concerns legislatively, piecemeal um, amendments, which of course put all members of parliament in a very difficult position because that's the only type of amendment that they can really bring. Um, but there's also some proposals that were made by the department that might indicate 
that there could be desirability of this bill. And because of that, I would recommend that the committee um, request those two departments to also come um, and address them on the desirability of this proposal by the member. Then I want to specifically focus on, um, oh, sorry, if I may just maybe also add on other departments. I just want to confirm to, to the members um, that it, there is more than enough legal precedent for a bill before one committee to be affecting legislation in other committees. That is partly why the rules also provide for committees to be able to consult with each other. So there is no concern in that regard. We are still within the legislative process here and we are still complying with the constitution, with the rules, etc. Then um, sub rule six of uh, rule, rule 286 sets out certain stages. It's more a guide but it does set out certain stages that the committee must follow. So what we have done now is 6A1 and 2, which says there must be informal discussion on the bill, the principles, the subject of the bill, must be a briefing by the department, by the member, and now two becomes very important, the consideration of public comments that have been received. Um, I am aware that the committee secretary uh, provided members with a very high level summary that I did of submissions. It was basically more who um, supported, who asked for, for more bit to be added, who did not support, and then a, a few substantive submissions that were made. Now, yeah, like I say, it's really more of a guideline because if I look in my experience, what other committees have done, it differs. When the rules just came out, the first couple of times in, in the fifth parliament when members' bills were considered, um, committees were more likely to simply consider this, the submissions that were made. Um, sometimes they held hearings, sometimes they simply looked at the submissions that, be, that came in. I suppose that also depended on the type of submissions that came in. What I can mention to members is that the NSPCA who was mentioned did in fact make a submission on this bill. Um, and if the committee considers to perhaps do public hearings, I would recommend that they may be one of the the, the person's um, called to, to participate in that. However, I must also caution the committee, there were thousands of submissions and it will not be possible for you to, to hear everyone. There were substantive submissions and if the committee decides to do public hearings on those submissions, I would suggest that that is where the committee starts. Other committees, however, in the sixth parliament have done their own call for comments. Partly, um, I suspect this is because the call all for comments from the member is only done in the government gazette. So not, you know, your, your, your normal person on the street does not read the, 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 the government gazette. Um, we rely on, on newspapers, radio, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and <clears throat> more and more, I have seen committees doing their own call for comments on a private member's bill. And then only after considering those comments, um, considering um, they, they've all held some public hearings, calling people in, listen to them, ask questions, then did they consider the motion of desirability on the bill? Because that then is the next step. So <clears throat> I just want to quickly su sum up what I've said. I would recommend that the committee calls the departments of trade and industry and the Department of Health to address them on, on the bill. That could happen if the committee decides to do a call for comments at the same time. Secondly, the committee must consider the public submissions that were made um, and can either do so by just considering the submissions themselves, the wording as they are there, or by having public hearings and calling some of the persons who have submitted and listened to them. Or the committee could lastly do their own call for comments. And of course, that is then the normal process that the committee is, is um, very used to. Um, and then the next step thereafter would be to adopt a motion of desirability on the bill. Just something else that I want to mention on process. The department made two proposals where should the committee find the bill to be desirable, that might be rather um, a better proposal for, for the bill's wording. I want to just confirm with the committee that a private member's bill in that regard works exactly the same as an executive bill. So in other words, the wording of the bill is not currently the thing for the committee to consider. What currently the committee must consider is the policy proposal. In other words, do we want to be more strict in respect of a ban of the testing of cosmetics on animals? And if that is the case, 
then the committee can adopt a motion of desirability. Anything that can, must be amended can, in fact, be done after that motion of desirability has then been adopted. So, for instance, the exceptions that were mentioned by the department, the bill currently does make already makes one provision for an exception. Um, it would be very easy to add those. The department also made a proposal for a different process um, that is also very easy to do um, as long as the department works with, with the committee so that we have that process uh, correctly worded. That can be done in the bill. But of course, these, what that I'm mentioning now, would be passed, um, and we first need to get to that hurdle of the motion of desirability. Um, Thank you, Chair. I hope I've not um, talked to everyone confused. Um, I hope I made sense. Thank you. Thank you, Mamu Fanda member, honorable members. That is uh, the input from uh, the legal services. Uh, I think it's worth uh, noting what uh, uh, recommendations have been and we'll take that into consideration but due to time we've exceeded uh, our uh, time that uh, we had to one o'clock and i therefore ask uh, the secretariat to note the input of uh, mamo fanda mevo and we will uh, then again uh, uh, engage uh, with uh, the input she has given and look uh, forward to seeing as to how best to proceed before we can even consider the desirability of the bill. I think uh, for now, let us uh, conclude on this uh, uh, juncture. I want to therefore thank all the honorable members for availing themselves for this portfolio committee meeting. Also thank the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development as led by the Honorable Minister, the Deputy Ministers, the DG and all its officials that attended this uh, meeting. We want to uh, thank uh, the um, special uh, buster uh, who's the dealing with the labor uh, tenant claims for having come before the committee and presenting to the portfolio committee and engaging with us uh, with the responses that they afforded the committee. Honorable members, we thank our legal services in parliament for the input uh, that they've given and we will consider uh, the input put before the committee. Have a wonderful afternoon. We do have a session uh, this afternoon as we proceed with other engagements uh, on the National Assembly. I therefore wish you all a great week ahead and enjoy uh, the rest of the week. Take care. The meeting stands adjourned. Thank you. Are we going to see you in the parliament? Yes, uh, you, you <laughs> must, um, Patissa. You know, virtual allows you to log in. Eh? Allows you to log in. So I will uh, be present and in full attendance. <laughs> You'll be half present and half working. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Chen. Thank you. All Mary. right, Patricia. Take care. Have a lovely Masipa Utojile, who Masipa Kakwa. Masipa Upi Utoji. Bye bye, honorable members. Bye.